Hey everybody, welcome to We've Got Worm, a Daily Planet Films podcast series where we expertly dissect and discuss the hit web serial Worm, week by week, arc by arc. My name is Matt Freeman, your host and giant looming unkillable man beast, and I'm joined as always by Scott Daly, the guy that gets sliced in half by a tail whip five seconds into any major battle. Scott, how are things going this week? That's that's actually true. That would that would be me in this battle. Uh, <laughs> that would be me in this battle too, actually. <laughs> I'm, t- I'm doing really good, Matt. Um, and yes, uh, in this podcast, you guide me, a first-time reader of Worm, through this tsunami-filled chaos as I inspect, interpret, and even speculate on what the story is and where it is going. This week, if uh, we didn't give you a big enough hint, we are covering Arc 8, Extermination, the culmination of everything we've read into this point, a huge giant battle with a, a Godzilla monster and a whole bunch of crazy stuff. And I'm, Matt, I'm so excited to talk about all this. I'm excited too, Scott. This is a big one. I've been looking forward to this for two months now. Yeah, and every, um, like, it's like I've seen it in hints and stuff. Like, I feel like it's been built up and... I feel like my expectations were, were pretty high and uh, it did not let me down. I'll say that. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad. Yeah, I was I was a little bit worried about that, but I didn't think it would. Yeah. Uh, but before we get into all of that stuff, I think we've got a, a couple quick announcements. That's right. Uh, late on Friday, our Patreon page hit its first milestone goal, which means that we now have sufficient funds coming in to be able to spin off. We've got Worm onto its own podcast feed, which is something a lot of you have been requesting. So starting next month, you'll be able to subscribe to We've Got Worm individually via whatever podcasting app you're using. And if you listen to YouTube, nothing will change because technology. Uh, we'll be sure to announce when the new feed goes live, and we'll be double posting the next few weeks in both feeds so that everyone will get a chance to make the switch over to the new feed. As part of this, we've also stood up some new social media accounts. If you use Twitter, you can now follow the podcast at GotWormPod. Uh, and you can reach us via email at gotwormpod at gmail.com. Uh, for more details, you can head over to dailyplanetfilms.com or just click the link in this week's show notes. Yeah, yeah, this is really exciting. Um, thank you so much, everyone who donated last week to get us over the hump. I think someone like made a comment in the Reddit thread that said something effective. Can we get this in another feed? And then before you and I actually got to respond, someone else swooped in and said, all you have to do is donate to them. And I was like, oh, thanks. And then, yeah. and then people did. Yeah, self-solving problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the other thing that we realized when we hit this goal is that along with this new feed, this new quote unquote show, uh, we need a cover art image to go on iTunes and on our Twitter and all these other places. We have one for the daily planet podcast that I really like. Um, but we don't have one for worm and Matt, you and I cannot draw at all. Yeah. I mean, I can draw with a, with a pencil sometimes (laughs) and I don't know how that would translate. I I I don't know if it would be good. No, but we do know that there, there, there are a lot of worm fans out there that are very good artists because we we try to feature a new uh, image on every episode of of fan art that we've just found. So we had this really cool idea that if we reached out to you guys in the community to see if you could come up with a really cool cover image art for us. Um, So you would submit that to us. We'll pick our favorites and show them all off on the Reddit thread for a future episode and then select one image, the one that we like the most, to be the cover art for our show. Um, you can head on over to dailyplanetfilms.com right now uh, for details on the competition, like kind of the requirements and where to send the stuff and all that. Um, and we'll put that link in the show notes as well if you want to read more about that. So hopefully um, we'll get some really good entries. I'm excited to see what some of you guys come up with um, because it would be better than anything I could do. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm excited to see the results of that too. Um, So moving along, uh, this week we're not going to have our usual discussions of the comments and questions, uh, partially because uh, Arc 8 is so long, um, and and, and there's plenty to discuss already, and it's very intense, and and we're we're, we're good, you know. Um, But also because Arc 8 is largely considered to be the end of the first book of Worm, um, so we're going to use this as kind of a, a break point, and... We're going to take a week off from doing the show, and next week, um, instead of there being Arc Nine, it will be um, um, it will be a mailbag episode. Yeah, yeah. Um, so basically, that means that every question that you guys have been asking us that we haven't been able to get to because of time, um, or every other question that you wanted to ask us that you just haven't gotten a chance to. We will be doing that all next week. So a full 
hour, hour and a half. We'll go for basically as long as there are good questions. Um, and we'll be addressing all your questions. You can ask us anything about the first eight arcs of Worm, and you can ask me where I think the book is going to go from here. Um, obviously, we can't have any spoiler questions. You can't ask Matt anything about arcs nine plus because i will be able to hear it <laughs> that would ruin things but uh i think i think i'm really excited about this um i think it's gonna be a lot of fun yeah yeah and, and we'll get to all the later stuff anyway so there's no need to worry and, and i think you know some people have suggested like a big a big you know discussion q a after this whole project is done and, and i think uh just be writing down your questions and your and your own little uh notebooks and and wait for that day yeah and i think you've said that there are other kind of breaks in the story where like mm -hmm. a, another the book two would end um yeah. and i think so i think going forward we're going to do this anytime we get to a big a big stopping spot taking a second for us to recharge our batteries and then also just to take a second to make sure we've involved you guys and addressed any questions that you had of us and i think you know i think we're, we're largely going to try to keep this uh, to worm related questions. Um, but if we do have some time, if you want to ask us some more general questions about like just podcasting or what other art we'd like, and if you want to get personal, maybe we'll answer a few questions about us. If you want to know that, I don't know if you would, but Hey, whatever. Um, so yeah. So, you know, uh, Matt, where can, where can they submit these questions? Uh, they can submit them on the episode eight Reddit thread, which is where most of the discussion happens, or they can post on dailyplanetfilms.com. Uh, they can ask questions via U uh, YouTube comments on our videos, um, unless they're about Uber and Leet's power set. We're going to ignore those. <laughs> um, or you can shoot an email to gotwormpod at gmail.com. Questions can be submitted all the way up to the afternoon of May 2nd. So get asking. Um, our coverage of Arc 9 and beyond will resume as usual on May 10th. Awesome. Yeah, so without further ado, let's move into the discussion of Arc 8. Oh, yes, yes. Which I've been waiting for for so long. So this week, um, it's going to be pretty much as usual, except I'm probably going to be spending more time talking about the, like what I feel is the narrative function of various beats rather than just summarizing the beats. I think Arc 8 is a narrative masterstroke in a lot of ways, and it would be a disservice to just blandly recount what happens. Yeah, I, th I think I think that's that's a good general strategy because this is a kind of an unusual arc. Like, I had kind of gotten into a rhythm where most arcs start off with character work and then build to a climactic battle and then have a little uh, lowering of action at the end where the, some character work this is kind of opposite we jump immediately into action and stay in action for half the arc and then we kind of wind down uh, and although it's like narratively more intense at the end of the, the story um, it's not action oriented so um, this is going to be a little different but equally good yeah I think this is the fruit of all of the of all the building and ratcheting up that we've had up to this point so there's so when you start this arc there doesn't need to be any more any more building we're there we're ready um yeah so um when we left our heroes last week taylor had just learned that coil had kidnapped dinah alcott due to taylor's actions and it essentially quit the undersiders and then almost immediately the in the inbringer siren started and she and tattletail head to aid in the defense so we open 8.1 with Tattletail and Taylor making their way through panic and chaos to the gathering point for the parahuman response. And, you know, <laughs> remember how we talked about last week that the first chapter of any given arc does double duty and like giving us information, but also setting up stuff um, at the same time. Look at, yes, look do. at, look at the first two sentences in this arc and like how just perfectly crafted they are in doing that like i have them right here the crush of bodies was a tide that tattletail and i had to push through there were thousands of more scared people in our immediate area surging against and around us so this is very clear like water imagery used here yeah. to describe this which of course is going to be like everything that the endbringer leviathan does throughout uh, the rest of this arc so i just like stuff like that like I just yeah. nerd out on it because, like, you see it and you're like, oh, my God, this is so clever and so well done. And it's like you probably wouldn't even notice it. Um, I didn't notice it until I think my second read through. But then at the same time, you maybe you notice it subconsciously. I don't know. It's just fun. Like words. Words are fun. 
Yeah, I do feel like there's got to be something subconscious happening with just 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 the phrase "crush of bodies." Um, you know, by itself, it's you know, just in this sentence, it's it's just like, oh, you know, it's a crowd. But in context of what happens soon, it means something else. Yep, yep. So as they're approaching Dragon, they see Dragon uh, waiting outside of the meeting point in a giant, enormous mech, watching the approaching storm cloud. Yeah, I think this <laughs> this arc is just taking things that Scott loves and throwing them in worm. <laughs> and like, yeah. So like all of a sudden there's a giant mech in this and I'm like, yes. And that it only gets better from here. So like at this point in my reading this past week, I was like, okay, I'm in. Yeah. And, and once, and once you see a giant mech in a superhero setting, you're like, well, of course giant mechs belong in superhero settings. Right. Yeah. Especially in a world where we've already declared tinker a superhero class. So of course someone is going to be proficient at making a giant fighting robot. Yep. Uh, Alexandria's team teleports in right in front of Taylor, and Taylor is awestruck. I mean, you may remember that Taylor thinks about Alexandria fairly frequently as being like the heroic cape that that has been her like childhood hero. Um, yeah, she had a lunchbox of her, right? Yeah, she did. Um, a, a boy with metal skin leads a group of teenagers out of the teleportation area and gives Taylor a gesture of solidarity on the way past. Uh, inside, she finds. Empire 88, the Travelers, New Wave, and the local heroes. Um, and everyone is gathered in separate clusters, but they're all peacefully coexisting together in this space. Coil and Faultline's crew are not present. Yeah, so I found this very funny and odd, right? Um, it, it's like, especially the moment where this hero like claps Taylor on the back and there's this moment of like solidarity between these good guys and these bad guys. It, it like reminded me a lot, you know, that trench warfare story in world war one where like it was christmas time and the sides just called a ceasefire to celebrate christmas for a night um right. and it's, so it's like like you just see human beings like how how much they're at conflict with each other tend to put aside this terribleness in moments of either like great joy or like great danger and that's i think yeah. what we're seeing here except coil fuck that guy he's not here but um yeah. it's just it's just very it's just very weird seeing like someone how we know as bad as as Kaiser standing in the same room as like the biggest heroes on the planet. Um, and it's like, I think it, this, like we still at this point in the story don't know what an end bringer is, but we just have this really good idea just from st set up like this, just like seeing how these terrible people are willing to work with the good guys to stop this thing, like sets up how serious this threat is. Oh Yeah. This this perfectly sets the stakes because it's explicitly saying all of those other stakes that you've been seeing in the story so far, we're we're setting all of those aside yeah. because the stakes that we're now facing make those irrelevant, basically. So very, very good ratcheting up of, of the stakes and the tension there. Yep. So inside, there's also uh, Legend, uh, who is described as maybe the top flying artillery cape. And so is Idolin. That's how I'm going to pronounce it. You can correct me. No, I think I, I think I, that's right. I mean, that's okay. like they're the summons in Final Fantasy IX, which shows how nerdy I am. But yeah, um, that's I what they call them in Final Fantasy IX. And I think I mean there wasn't. That's how I pronounced it. So I'm going to okay. say you're right. All right, that's the official pronunciation now. Done. And uh, and he's kind of hanging in the back. Um, so now that we've got some impressions of each of the three members of the Triumvirate, Alexandria Legend and Idolin. Do you have any thoughts about them? I think it's cool that like we just got enough information about them, like kind of sprinkled through the rest of the book up to this point that we like feel their impact. Um, you know, like the description through Taylor's point of view really like cements how important these guys are. And like they're like the tone of the story has this air of power and leadership whenever she describes them. Um, and that's especially surprising consider considering Taylor's like, hatred of authority um so like that that again sets up like how important these guys are that she can even look past that and be like impressed by these people yeah i think the triumvirate are primarily interesting because the story is not about them because like in traditional comments uh, c comics it, it would be um these three don't actually map all that cleanly onto any dc or, or marvel heroes except maybe like alexandria onto superman but they're all flying, super strong, super destructive demigods. And in contrast, our hero is Bug Girl. <laughs> right. It would be like uh, if the first Justice League movie focused on like Blue Beetle or some other minor <laughs> DC 
uh, DC hero. It's, it's one of those things that like really does differentiate this story that like we, we follow the street level, uh, superhero who at, at the time of their, uh, creation, I guess, did not have that, those demigod type powers. Right. Um, fun fact though, I, I had to do a search for a superhero that fit. Because I, I just don't know Blue Beetle off the top of my head. I'm not that into comics. But while I was doing this Google search, I I stumbled upon a real DC superhero named Arm Falloff Boy, um, whose okay. whose superpower involves him <laughs> removing one of his arms and then using it as a club to hit people with. Wow! This is a real comic book that was made. I love. That's excellent. This is why I love comics. It's amazing. And that's really appropriate to uh, the subject matter of this arc. Actually, <laughs> it actually is spoilers. Yeah. There's, there's, there may in fact be an arm fall off boy in this very <laughs> chapter. Um, all right. Uh, so Taylor spends some time looking over the room and naming capes that she knows or describing capes that she barely knows and is, has maybe heard of. Tattletail departs from her and goes to join the undersiders. And now Taylor is alone. Even, even Sundancer, who had kind of been warm to her before, is, is avoiding her. Yeah, I I love this because like Taylor is now alone. And I think, you know, there's a lot that happens in arc eight. But I think the biggest thing to me that happens is we see Taylor hit her low point. And like, not only do we, do we see Taylor hit a low point, but like her low point keeps like we think we're here right now and then things get worse and then it just keeps getting worse and worse for her um but she's like lost among this grandness of this moment she's like back to being an insect again um yeah. and like one of the things i don't think we give wild bow enough credit for because we spend two hours a week <laughs> praising him but <laughs> we, we're not uh, specific sometime is like how he manages tone um and, and i think a lot of the stuff that happens in this arc, a lot of the action in this arc is closer to like a horror story than it is an actual action set piece. Um, because Taylor, like for the majority of this battle is kind of powerless and helpless. She's like a soldier without a gun. Um, and I think this is all kind of set up in this first chapter. Um, this, this, this feeling of powerlessness she has even before the battle's begun. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that comment uh, that, that it's closer to a horror story uh, than, a, than an adventure or an action story. I, I think Wild Bo is actually blending genres here. Um, I mean, we, we just mentioned that, that there's there's a mech here suddenly and we're about to get a kaiju. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so. So, yeah, it's 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 cross pollinating all these different ideas. And, yeah, I, I, I love your pointing out that really the main thing that's going on here is that she's alone. She hasn't been alone since the first arc really right um and it's a very different experience you know for her and for us as the reader uh, so legend gets everyone's attention i guess he's leading this this whole thing uh, i guess he's yeah and he gives a quote-unquote inspirational pre-battle speech which goes like this but you should know your chances going in. Given the statistics from our previous encounters with this beast, a good day still means that one in four of the people in this room will probably be dead before this day is done. <laughs> Maybe let someone else make the speeches. Um, but this, <laughs> I mean, but again, this perfectly reinforces the tone, right? Like we are setting expectations. We are, and not only are we setting expectations, we're constantly reminding ourselves of it, right? Like that's the primary function of this chapter is this is a big fucking deal. Um, a lot of people are about to die and yeah. like we got that before we even moved on from this, this, this chapter. Yeah. All right. So 8.2 begins and the rain is coming in really hard Just buckets. <laughs> Almost as if the storm is literally approaching. Yeah. Like narratively and, and literally. Yes. It's, uh, it's, it, it is setting that, um, that, tone in your mind in a very effective conscious and unconscious way mm -hmm. so he's describing leviathan um uh, legend is as something between the physical powerhouse of behemoth and the cunning manipulator of the simurg i think this is maybe this right here is maybe the most we learn about both of these guys uh the other inbringers had we even heard Behemoth's name prior to this? No, um, they hadn't used any of these three names. At least okay. I missed, I, I have not heard any of these, so. Yeah, I mean, they've been sprinkling this, just the tiniest amount of information about them, mainly just in context of, like, that's morbid, don't talk about that. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, Leviathan is described as both cunning and strong, having attributes of both of the others. Leviathan is focused on water. He generates a passive afterimage of water, basically manifesting a volume of water corresponding to the volume of space his body has just moved out of. So as he moves, he's constantly depositing tons of water on the battlefield. And as we'll see, he puts this to good tactical use. And on top of all this, he has crude hydrokinesis on a very large scale, and he's <laughs> and he's far faster than any speedster they have on record. Yeah, so let's talk about Leviathan for a, a bit, because last week you asked me right before the end of the section what an Endbringer was, and I answered as honestly as I could, but I was completely wrong. And um, I think it's funny because, like, Sometimes I make these guesses and, and I see people or you tell me when people are like shocked and awed by, by some of these <laughs> things that I come up with. Um, and, and really all I'm doing is like reading hints and setups in the story because I've read so many stories that I can see these things. Um, I, I don't think that I'm more insightful about this than anyone that's listening to the podcast. I'm just reading it to an extremely detailed level and I'm a huge nerd about it. So, um, but I think it's cool that even this, like there was, there was no real setup for what a end bringer was. And I think that's very intentional. Um, and I think it works. And before someone gets on my case about <laughs> the difference between this reveal and the arms master reveal, um, because people tend to do that every time I say I like a reveal. <laughs> um, but, but I just, this works narratively because like, it makes sense why no one talked about these things before. Um, it, it makes, it's, it's not that Taylor didn't know what an Endbringer was. It's not that Taylor, like it's nobody talks about them. It's like, cause people are terrified of talking about them. They're like, the, the, they're like death hanging over your shoulder that you refuse to acknowledge because like, there's, there's nothing you can really do about it. So Everyone just goes along happily as if they don't exist until the moment that they're sitting at your doorstep. And I just think that really works really well. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the the helplessness of it all is is definitely the major component of it because it's like if one of these, you know, yeah, if, if one of these guys shows up at your city, you're you're guaranteed massive devastation. There's right. like no outcome where you don't get massive devastation. So yeah. Yeah, and um, I and I love having kaiju in this this story by the way um yeah i love monster movie flicks like i love godzilla I, like the original king kong is one of my favorite movies i actually liked the peter jackson king kong um which is gonna surprise a lot of people probably <laughs> um but and i the pacific rim film i think that was 2014 that came out um that made me feel like a little kid again so like this twist on the story like we were saying earlier with the mech thing is just like tossing elements that i love into the story that i already really liked so that's really exciting it also kind of got my mind racing trying to like recontextualize everything we've learned up until this point with these new things in it um i think we'll talk more on that later but yeah i love yeah, this. that makes sense yeah right i mean doesn't kaiju plus superheroes seem like such a natural combination of story concepts once you've seen it yeah like has like i, I know there's been like large bad guys in comic books before but i don't know if it's been on this scale with this level of power to it um I, like superman's fought big things before but nothing quite like this i think it's great yeah i yeah i don't know if i've seen anything quite like this anywhere else so uh it's also while, while they're talking about leviathan it's mentioned that he basically wiped out the islands of newfoundland um and kyushu in previous attacks killing literally millions of people uh, and legend mentions that the kyushu event uh in particular um, happened due to the defender's strategy of trying to hem Leviathan in rather than confront him directly. So that's why that's, I, I think that's a, a way of dropping in the explanation of like, that's why the tactic for this battle is direct confrontation rather than any kind of attempt to confine him. Yeah. And again, they've set stakes for us here, right? Cause like I saw that figure nine and a half million people and immediately yeah. was like, what's the worst disaster that's happened on our planet? Because yeah. like, and I looked, it's 1931, the central China floods occurred in July and August when the Yangtze river in China, uh, flooded and, and like caused domino flooding across, across China. And 3.7 million people died in that event from drowning and disease and starvation over the course of two months. And that's like the worst disaster that's ever happened, uh, in human history. So this is like, two almost three times that in an instant yeah. so holy shit yeah right 
um yeah there's there's some there's some mention of um of the fact that Brockton Bay is basically sitting on top of an aquifer which uh which is which poses a risk because Leviathan could in theory use the water in the aquifer to to crack the you know the um the subsurface and cause a um some kind of subsidence i'm having my my professional life is intruding here a bit because <laughs> I, I i work for a living in 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 this general area um and th- there's a almost ubiquitous conception that aquifers are like giant caves of water underground when they're actually um just porous rock that's saturated with water so it's it's all rock all the way down it's just some of the some of the pore space of the rock has water in it but all that said like the explanation still still applies because if he has hydrokinesis and he can move the water that's saturating this rock then he could still crack the rock and cause massive seismic activity and really screw up Brockton Bay it just wouldn't look like Brockton Bay falling into a hole um so that's that's Matt's nerd corner nerd interlude <laughs> right there um so the goal of the fight in other words, is to keep constant heavy pressure on Leviathan and hurt him badly enough that he flees. Killing him is a vain hope. <coughs> Arms master. <coughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. He didn't listen. <laughs> and then Legend adds this note, which I think is important for us to pay attention to. He says, this is why we are tolerated, why society allows and accounts for the capes that walk the streets and fight in its towns, because we are needed for situations like this. With your assistance, we can forestall the inevitable. Your efforts, and if you choose to make them, your sacrifices will be remembered. Um, so, Scott, does Legend's narrative uh, here ring more true than Tattletail's explanation for why the cops and robbers' status quo is allowed to persist, or maybe both narratives have some elements that are true? Yeah, this is a really, really important moment of like clarity, right? Um, and I think you're probably right that it's probably a combination of the two. I like Legend's take on it better um, because Lisa still feels more like I can justify my crime because the system is allowing me to do it. Where Legend's, on the other hand, is much more like focused on uh, nobility and responsibility, which I think fits into the overall themes of the arc. Like there's a lot of choice and consequence and responsibility talk throughout these chapters. So I think that fits a lot better, Um, but it's probably a little of both. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely reminded of the of the last interlude where you know, we see that the human justice system, if you will, is really kind of, you know, what that's suggesting is that humanity is terrified of this whole cape phenomenon. Yeah. And because they're willing to put somebody like Canary in prison just because of misunderstanding, basically. But, um, but they can't just, you know, get rid of the capes because they need them because the inbringers will have absolutely no opposition apparently without them. Yeah. It, it, to, to, to go back to the status quo thing, it, it makes it seem like such a tenuous status quo, right? Like, yeah. it's like, we're only tolerating you because of these things. And like, it just makes it seem like if anything shifts one way or the other, like the whole system could collapse. And I think we're going to see that later in the arc when they talk about the truce between the two sides and how tenuous that is. Um, yeah. And it's really, it's <laughs> things are, are hanging on the edge of a knife here. Um, just yeah. in general, like constantly, like the, the status quo is edge of knife. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it, there's, there's, an, there's, there's a framework where the whole story at this point has been watching the status quo just kind of crack piece by piece. So at this point, the tactical armband communicators are handed out, which we're going to see used over and over again in this chapter. Oh, that's a really and, fun idea. Yeah. It, it's talk about narrative function. Uh, the capes are then broken up by their by their tactical function. The the tanks and the expendable combat gen, uh, combatant generators are in one group. The capes who can restrict Leviathan's movement are another, and then movers are another, and then long range attackers are the last. And Taylor isn't really sure where she fits into this because she doesn't fit in anywhere because this is her character low point. Yeah, storytelling. She, she has essentially no. Uh, no useful powers in this yeah. in this situation, yeah. but but she still she stays like it doesn't even occur to her that she should just be like, well, I'm basically like a mundane in this situation. I I have nothing to add, so I'm just gonna does not it like doesn't enter her stream of consciousness, does it? No, because Taylor's good, and that's like we're mean to her sometimes. And I know there was a little bit of an uproar when we said that the Endbringer coming is at least partially her fault. I still believe that is true, but 
Taylor is responsible and feels like the old great responsibility or great power, great responsibility adage. Like she feels like she has a duty to be here. Um, and that's yeah. good. Yeah. She, she feels like she has to do what she can and, and that's pretty much it. Yeah. Uh, so suddenly the building is hit by a tidal wave and the teleporter Cape Strider zaps everyone out of the building a- outside the high end boardwalk that we've seen a few times in the story is already shattered and, and destroyed. Yeah. A really cool moment that kind of like demonstrates very clearly that things will not be the same after this fight. Um, and, and, and I like throughout the arc throughout the fight, we do have little moments of Taylor pointing out like places she knows are destroyed. Like we're seeing like, this is going to change everything. And we're seeing that through the physical destruction that's happening. Yeah. Right. Totally. So she sees Leviathan pretty quickly and he's described, you know, even with all the talking about him, we just did, we never actually got a description until now. He's 30 feet tall, top heavy, long limbed with a lashing 50 foot tail and not much of a face, just four asymmetrical gashes with eyes in them. And then immediately, like there's no, there's no, there's no build up now. It's as soon as they see him, he, he dashes in and he's among them and you're getting, you're getting the armband notifications of of the the injuries and, and deaths the carapacitator down cd5 krieg down cd5 wcm deceased cd5 iron falcon down cd5 it's just it's like a um completely catches you off guard because you expect i don't know you're still i still feel like i was probably still programmed for like oh it's a superhero thing so there's going to be like some exchanges of blows and it's like, no, mm-hmm. he just, he just wades in and he just like wipes people out. Like, I mean, like a giant 30 foot tall monster in a crowd full <laughs> of people, basically yeah. like it just, there wouldn't even be, there wouldn't be like a fight. It would be, I mean, there is a fight cause there are some of the capes can stand up to him, but a lot of them can't. Yeah. And that's, I think that's important because I think every other story does that. Right. And I think every other story also ends on a cliffhanger here with like, the hero is on one side and Leviathan on the other. And there's this stand down and then we cut to black and then we come and then we pick up on it later. Um, but this says no to that. It says specifically, no, we're going to go now. And we end the cliffhanger on exactly, exactly where we need to show how bad the situation is. Yep. And of course, like I, like the communicator death announcements and, and injury announcements are like, it's brilliant. Um, and it becomes this kind of like soundtrack to the battle. Like, you know me, I'm imagining this cin- cinematically and like, I hear this is just like in the background, just like constantly going. And it just like adds to the drama, adds to the powerlessness that people feel like it punctuates. Like we talked about it being a horror, like it punctuates e- each moment um, with more horror because we're not just seeing what's happening. We're getting these announcements showing this person's dead. This person's dead. And it's just, oh, it's so, it's so smart to do it this way. Yeah. It reminds me of, of like the sonar thing in, in aliens where it's just this audio cue that the, the, in that case, the movie, in this case, the, the, the book like trains you to associate with horrible things are happening now. Right. And then it just like hits you with it right when it needs to. Yep. So we move to the Lisa interlude, uh, which which is a different interlude than usual, but I, I think you have some things to talk about uh, there. So a seemingly younger and down on her luck, Lisa is robbing people in a store on the boardwalk. I suspect it's intentional that the setting for the scene is the boardwalk, which was just offhandedly destroyed in like a single sentence in the last chapter. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, so Lisa is confronted by and scares away a shop employee with her power. And then the scene switches to the present day with Lisa and the undersiders preparing to face Leviathan. Uh, she notices Taylor being, you know, alone on the battlefield and notices how oblivious Taylor seems to the bugs everywhere and how she doesn't seem to notice people reacting to the bugs either. Yeah. Is this the first time we've seen Taylor um, from a different point of view? I think it is. I think um, other than like the fact that she saw a picture of herself in the newspaper, I think right. it is. But we've never we've never been in someone else's mind around Taylor before. Um, so yeah, we're getting this and this is something that the story has kind of beat into us, right? Is that Taylor's perception of what her bugs are like, Taylor's perception of what she looks like to other people is, um, is different, um, from reality. And we keep getting this over and over again. Yeah. 
So pragmatically, Tattletale takes the opportunity to tell the others that if she dies, an envelope will arrive, letting them know how to access their money. We then switch back to the past at the boardwalk, and we get our first glimpse of Tattletale's power from inside her head. It's like a chain of assertions that build on themselves that, that are coming in from, you know, from the outside as she sees it, following her train of thought. Yeah, this interlude is, is really weird, and we'll talk about that more in a bit, but I think the importance of its existence is right here, um, because ex- understanding from a narrative level like how Tattletale's power works um, I think is so important. I don't think it's completely key to the plot that we understand how it is, but it just like it clarifies so much for the reader on what like expert intuition quote unquote means and what it looks like. And it also allows us to understand who Lisa is so much more. Right. Because I know I, I've detected over the over the weeks that, that you're pretty suspicious of Lisa. And I think a lot of people are suspicious of Lisa because that's just the nature of her power and the nature of her character is to be lying and manipulating constantly so if anything that's why i sometimes subtly try to point out things where she does something that's a very difficult to fake sign of of one thing or another because um you know really it's it's hard to know where she stands on things when she knows Mm -hmm. more than she should so eventually she directs her power at a wealthy looking man in the store and assesses where he keeps his valuables. She approaches him to pick his pocket, but then tries to flee when her power tells her that he has a gun. She then realizes that she's actually being hemmed in by a group of professionals and that it's a trap. Uh, Tattletail is then disabled and dragged outside. And I like the subsequent vignette between her and the uh, mercenaries because it shows that Tattletail habitually projects confidence and humor and detachment even when she's in a very weak position and when she's in fact frightened for her life and it puts a different lens on all the bravado that we've seen from her in previous encounters because really now that we're in her head we see that she's not fearless she just hides her fear really well yeah that that's a really good point and it kind of ties into my theory about her before that we don't really know how much she's just bullshitting because we see her bullshit a lot in this like specifically yeah. with the woman in the shop that she scares away at the beginning like she didn't know everything she said to her she knew enough to say things that made the other stuff she was making up seem truer and she uses that to her advantage um, and and uses her power to construct convincing lies to manipulate people yeah yeah that's right so uh the mercenaries give her a phone and she takes a call from somebody who's probably coil offering to hire her and then back in the present day leviathan is tearing people apart while tattletale tries to use her power to learn as much information about him as she can. Um, Kind of in the middle of this, we get a little aside. Tattletale says to Regent, and I guess your secret weapon isn't going to work here either. And Regent replies, take two or three times as long, probably, if it worked at all, Regent grumbled. Fuck, I'm useless. So, Scott, what's this about? I have no idea. I can't even speculate on this. Um, the weird thing is, like, this interlude is like a bonus, right? Like, they hit a donation goal or whatever, so Wild Bo rewarded his readers with a bonus interlude. Um, but, like, I always suspected that there was more to Alex's power that we hadn't really explored because of all the undersiders. We understand his the least, but this feels like a level of importance that I wasn't expecting from, like, a bonus interlude. Um, I, I have no idea what this is. I can't even speculate. Yeah, I probably should have done my homework on what exactly the nature of a bonus interlude is, because is, is it like, would this, would we just not have this chapter if the donation goal hadn't been reached? And, and it, in, in which case, that certainly causes you to put the information you learn in a, in a donation bonus chapter under a different level of, of waiting. Right, um, right. Yeah. But uh, we can we'll talk about that probably next time. I'll, I'll, I'll figure out what the answer to that is. So they're watching the fight. Alexandria jets in and engages Leviathan. It's pretty badass, but he grabs her with his tail and holds her underwater. Dragon swoops in and launches a salvo of missiles and then collides with Leviathan and gushes some kind of tinker flames onto him. Lisa asks to be flown to a rooftop for a better vantage. And uh, while she's watching, Dragon ejects from her suit in a smaller suit, and then the big suit detonates on top of Leviathan, and Lisa's power informs her that actually the smaller suit is unmanned, 
Um, so it was basically a, a drone inside a giant suit. Yeah, so we're just seeing a, a mech fighting a kaiju in the middle of the superhero book, and there's no way I can express myself <laughs> in an audio format <laughs> in how, how much I love this. But I was just like slack jawed, and I was like fist pumping, and like it, it's amazing. Yeah, well, while well, you've already mentioned that I can't actually draw, I, I feel tempted to make a fan art of this uh, <laughs> that I will keep to myself and not, not uh, put upon the world. Uh, so other stuff that's happening is uh, Tattletail's power is giving her information about Leviathan's durability and the fact that he's ridiculously durable and gets exponentially more durable as you go deeper into his body. Um, another tidbit is the, the power says not human and then she thinks knew that much and then the power adds not human never was human and this is this is new and i mean I, I distinctly you know what you said last week was you know i'm guessing that um that that uh inbringers are some kind of really powerful cape and i think almost everyone thinks that i certainly thought that but if you say it never was human that's distinctly right contradictory or, or not, not contradictory it's it contradicts the assumption right yeah yeah and this again this is the weirdness of the chapter to me because this information feels really important um and this is in a quote-unquote bonus interlude so would this information have been given to us in a normal chapter if it wasn't here i don't know um like because taylor can't just like look at lisa and say give me information because they're not together at this point so um i don't know this is really this is really weird <laughs> yeah right it's it, i mean i I'm, I'm always interested to talk about this type of thing because you know while it's not strictly textual i, I think that it's interesting to talk about where the um serial web serial format has uh unique things that it can do and things that are different and things that are maybe may more difficult to manage um i think that's one case here yeah yeah and I, that's uh, i'll go ahead and jump to it now we've got a little bit more but that's the weirdest thing like when i when i read this i thought about what is this going to look like um when this is finally transferred over to book format um and where this is going to fall in place because this interlude breaks a lot of the rules that have been set up like books kind of teach you how to read them right like and this we've been very specifically instructed we have a certain number of chapters from this point of view and then we have one chapter at the end that jumps to someone else um but it usually takes place in a different time or place from where the main action is going and this one is different from that in just about every way um so like i i love this idea of having these bonus interludes because i think it makes serialized storytelling unique um and we get to like but where where was the, where would this fall you know like because i think like everything that that tattletale sees in the fight against leviathan we see again from taylor's point of view just like different slightly different in a minute so i don't know like it's not that i don't like it i like the chapter a lot it's just weird yeah yeah um it's it's fleshing this fleshing the setting out a lot in one sense and fleshing out other characters so yeah um so so moving on um Tattletail is eventually able to conclude something like a weak point on Leviathan's body, and she starts to tell her communicator about it, but a wave hits and interrupts her. And then Leviathan almost immediately climbs up on the roof of the building that she's on and starts wrecking people and uses hydrokinesis to push her off the roof. And uh, we flash back again to Tattletail meeting the other undersiders for the first time, and we see that she had a pretty damn good read on them after about 30 seconds. Yeah, isn't there like a real sense of finality to the way this this interlude ends that I yeah, think definitely. really ties into um, when we go to Taylor's chapter and we hear that Tattletale is dead. Um, but like it, it really feels like this. This is the moment of like, oh, this is how she got together with everyone. And then like we're going to move on from her, which really scared me in this moment. Because yeah. as as much as I critique this character, I like the character of Lisa Tattletale a lot. She's very complicated. I really enjoy learning more about her and, and all this stuff. So um, when we hear that she's dead in a couple minutes, I was legitimately terrified for a minute. Yeah, no, I, I thought she I thought she was dead. I was like, I was like, yep. I mean, that that was a send off chapter right there. Yeah, exactly. 
so yeah, I mean, that's that's where we leave off with her. And then we start at 8.3, back to Taylor. Leviathan is decimating the heroes, and Taylor is almost useless. So she asks to be directed where she can be useful, just as someone giving first aid. She uh, She's directed, you know, by her armband um, to go in a certain direction. She comes across a floating dismembered leg and a dying person who she can't help. She passes them by and finds a wounded bird-themed cape. And uh, she tries to help carry him away from the action, while in the background, Leviathan looms, continuing to kill and maim. Um, and actually, th- at this point, th- this is Alexandra being held underwater while Dragon tries to burn him. So this is essentially, like you said, Scott, um, I think this is the scene that we just saw from Lisa's point of view. Yeah, but I think the cool part about it is because we've seen it already, it can be much more of a background action, which yeah. ties into the, how small taylor is in this moment that like all these big things are just happening in the background while she's just trying to save one person while a bunch of other dead people are around her um so again that, that that's that's my confusion with the interlude is because like without the interlude like i don't know if this would work as well so yeah 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 i don't know i did notice i mean you, you actually pointed this out to me i did not actually notice that that was the same event shown from two angles until you pointed it out um but then once you did i realized that Taylor isn't even paying attention to the battle anymore at the point when Leviathan jumps off the roof and pushes Tattletail off. Right. So, so she doesn't, she doesn't see that happen at all. Um, I just thought that was an interesting touch to, to like, essentially while Bo is here choosing to take the narrative eye off of something that we know is happening. Um, Cause we, I mean, we, we already know what's happening. We don't need to see it again. Yeah. So somebody comes and takes the bird cape from her, and then she's directed to another person who seems to be bleeding out from some horribly bleeding wounds on their face and elsewhere. So she enlists the help of a fire cape to cauterize the bleeding wounds. (laughs) That's our tailor, so clever in her brutal ways to help people. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is this is brilliant, but I I just love that like she's like, oh yeah, we got to do this, just burn his face. Yeah, right, and 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 just so matter of fact about it. Yeah, 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 and their cape is like okay (laughs) yeah so taylor um observes at this point that the stronger capes seem to be staggering their attacks to keep leviathan on his heels uh while she so she you know she's checking in on the battle but she's really focused more on on the first aid she tries performing cpr on an obese cape that she finds Uh, meanwhile narwhal and ballistic employ a, a clever combo of their powers with projectiles and force fields to do a lot of damage to leviathan and then another tidal wave moves in, and Skitter has to abandon the cape she's helping in order to hide inside Shielder's bubble. These are like these are really great moments of character work, right? Because like we see how emotional that decision was for her, um, mm-hmm. and, and like it's re- like Taylor's in this really weird place right now, and she's conflicted and she's confused. But again, like at her core, at least right now, she is still a very good person. Um, she is trying to do the best she can and these little moments reinforce that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and this, I guess this would be a good time to, to kind of break out of the flow of the story a little bit and, and like remind us that she's like what, 16 or something. Right. Yeah. With like, she's not like a soldier. She's a, she's a normal person. Like, and, and she's basically, this is, I think a lot worse in terms of the trauma of it than even the like Kate battles she's been in, in the past because Oh yeah. Just, this is more like, like a war, um, even than the war that they, (laughs) the, the Cape war they were in last chapter, because at least in, in the last arc, um, there weren't like dismembered bodies lying everywhere. And, it, it it was still sort of on that cops and robbers spectrum. Well, yeah, because we've seen normal people die. I don't think we've seen a cape die, um, or Taylor hasn't at this yeah, point. I, I think, think this that's... is the first time she's seen a cape die, and that's like a whole other thing. Like there's this there's this hierarchy that seems like that, and once you've crossed that line, it's like we're in a whole different ball game again. Yeah, yeah. So so she's she's being put under geometrically greater level of like stress and and you know horribleness and she's she's handling it really well but i think that's kind of because she's in the same like autopilot mode that we've seen her go into over and over 
when she's in these tense situations, but it's not really the same type of situation here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so going back into the story, uh, Murden and Idolan work together to drain some of the water that uh, came in with the tidal wave, and then they knock Leviathan into a building with that water. And Vista starts trying to distort the building around him, and Bastion is inside the building with him using force fields to keep him trapped in there. And I, I, I didn't mention earlier, but Bastion was the cape who made some uh, ethnic slurs and was called on video, and, and Kaiser was looking at him eagerly. And uh, so now he is demanding that Vista collapse the building on them so that he can actually go out with some kind of noble sacrifice, which is I th like for, for the amount of sentences that were like, like the very small amount of time that was spent setting this up. This is a real gut punch of a, of a moment, I think. Yeah. Well, and it just, it just further blurs lines between bad and good, right? Like, I mean, it, it is, it is completely, absolutely true that this guy that's saying saying racist slurs is wrong but um because he did bad things he can also be a good person still um mm -hmm. and i think this is like this is just another way to show the wrestle between the black and white versus the gray um, yeah and, and one of the things i wanted to point out here um th like throughout this whole battle we're getting so many new superpowers thrown at us like pretty constantly um some of these we've seen before some we've seen that look similar to others um but you know some we've never seen at all before and i really really appreciate like how the information of these new powers and these new uh, superheroes is kind of doled out to us without really slagging the pace at all because like this is a really fast moving series of chapters and if you had to stop every time and explain in detail the specifics of what each character was doing, that would just kill your pace and the exposition would just overwhelm the action. And that doesn't happen here. So we're like, we're not getting a full, well-rounded grasp of what each of these people can do, but it's like just enough to understand and be able to visualize the action and, and nothing more. Yeah, and you're you're right where Taylor is in terms of understanding. She's she's like, ah, he's got some kind of fire. Yeah, some yeah. Kind of green fire. That's all I really care about, and that's like that's all that really matters, frankly, at this point. Um, and and then of course, while those leaning on the fact that he has really firmly established a wide range of Cape's powers, um, like vista collapses the building on him and it's interesting to me because i didn't actually know you know you don't know before this that vista, vista could collapse a building by basically attenuating the middle part and causing it to be weak and whatever but based on what you know of her powers that makes sense and it doesn't really it doesn't trip yeah. you up you're, yeah. you're not like how did that happen you're right it's a combination of powers we know and powers we don't to do something cool um yeah, yeah. it's just it's just very it's it's very well executed yeah Almost in passing, Taylor notices that the PHQ building, is, the, the high-tech fortress, is destroyed and, like, shattered and, and on its side or whatever. Yeah, you think that would be a big event, but yeah, to Taylor, yeah. it's just, oh, that happened. Uh, there, there it is. Uh, then her arm, or her, so her armband was, like, off for a while after the, um, after the tidal wave, and then it wakes up and rattles off over 30 names, uh, and it doesn't give any context as to whether those people are dead or not. And we'll later learn that some of them are and some of them aren't. Um, this armband is actually pretty de demoralizing. Uh, but <laughs> the, the, the main thing is that Tattletail's name is listed here. Um, yeah. Yeah, this is when I think I texted you and was like screaming into my phone. Yeah. <laughs> that I don't yeah. believe this. Um, but like we mentioned, this is this is where, you know, that interlude made it seem so final that this death was absolutely believable in the moment. And it landed like really hard. It, it landed about as hard for Taylor as it did for me. And like, it's very emotional. Yeah. Yeah. And and again, I was pretty sure she was dead and, and I was happily surprised later in the story, you know, when you find out she's not And in, in most stories, you would make the opposite assumption. You'd be like, Oh, they're not really going to kill the, the established character. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, not not this story. The stakes are quite quite believable at this point. So uh, Taylor, now that she's out of the um, out of Shielder's bubble, she goes to to where the action is. Fog and Sundancer have Leviathan hemmed in in kind of a a narrow area, and Miss Militia fires two of Bakuda's grenades at Leviathan. 
and these are actually pretty effective in terms of damaging him. And this scene kind of made me regret that Bakara was sent to the birdcage and then murdered. Um, because even if she were still a villain, she might have chosen to participate in this fight, and then they'd have just that little extra edge, wouldn't they? Yeah, or she would have just, like, dropped her nuclear bomb on the thing and then been like, what? I got him. <laughs> She's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Scott, you want to make an omelet? You got to detonate. <laughs> you got to kill millions bomb. of people. Yeah, right. It's worth it, Scott. So um, Leviathan avoids the time bubble grenade, and then tosses a trio of capes into it, including the promising Dauntless. Man, this one really surprised me, because, like, I guess Wildbow's so thorough in his setup for some of these heroes that you just think that it's going to pay off later in some way. Like, I really felt like we were going to keep seeing this guy again and again with improved, like, I've improved my armor to do this now, and then, nope, you're dead. I was just like, huh, okay. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, like, the explicitly mentioned, like, he could grow to be one of the strongest capes, and oh, no, he's dead. So, yeah, it's, uh, it was it was surprising, and that's just, like, yet another element that's showing you, like, no one is immune here. No, Nothing previously established in the story gives anyone plot armor. Yep. And then Leviathan kills Shielder, who is one of the new wave capes, and you see the, like, horrific grief of of his family members witness this yeah and to just rub salt in the wound this was a guy that just not a few minutes ago was the one that saved taylor from the tidal wave right exactly. at like great exertion to himself like one of the reasons he died was because his power was like basically tapped like he was exhausted and yeah. he used some of that to help our hero and so it's like it's like this pang of oh that sucks yeah and she and totally. taylor feels it too which i think is important yeah, yeah, that's that's one thing. I mean, we I might might should spend more time on the fact that like Taylor is feeling the pain of all of all of this carnage that's happening around her. Yeah, um, because she can't like she can't. There's nothing she can do. Like at this point, she really. I mean, she's helped. She's dragged a few people away with first aid, but she's not done anything, and she doesn't know what to do. And she, there's nothing. I mean, realistically, there's nothing she can do. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, to the, the 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 drama, the drama and the and the em- empathic like pain the reader feels in this part is effective to the extent that you're you're identifying with and empathizing with Taylor, and she is your your human like root, like uh, root in the situation. Mm-hmm. So at this point, Taylor's arm is broken when she's struck by the after image that that Leviathan kind of throws around. And uh, and it kind of smashes her arm into a windowsill, I think. Yeah, we even talked about how cool that idea is. Um, I've never seen a water power like that done with like a, a, a water superhero or anything. So that's this is really fun idea. Um, and it and it it's like thematically supported too, because like it's almost as if he's damaging people without even touching them. So it's like how it shows how much more powerful he is than them. I just I just really like it. Yeah, I mean it's it's actually you you rarely see water respected properly, but there's there's like a physical effect called the water hammer where people can totally and and sometimes are killed by unexpected surges of like just amounts of water hitting them in in various like engineering settings. Mm-hmm. Um, it's uh, so yeah, you could totally kill somebody by just like throwing a a band of water in their direction and it would like cut them in half because it you know. It's like, it's like falling from a high from a high height onto water. Yeah. Uh, so and then suddenly, like in the middle of of this onslaught, Leviathan just stops, and it takes a few moments for Taylor to realize what's happened. Although what I liked about this is I'm pretty sure that as the reader, you figure out what's happened more quickly than Taylor because you're so well versed in all the powers in the setting. But anyway, clock blocker has managed to tag him. But now Clock Blocker is going to drown because he he's like embedded in the water that is that is time locked around him, but he's not time locked himself. So Taylor uses a neighbor's armband to request the teleporter to get him out. Um and then Trickster shows up to do it and Trickster's shows himself to be kind of a weird guy here. Yeah, but in like a great way. <laughs> um like he he like thanks a dead cape for his sacrifice. And then teleports the dead cape in into the clockblocker's place. Like it's a really, it's a cool moment. Um, yeah. 
I was a little surprised that Clockblocker's power worked on Leviathan. Um, I guess I just kind of assumed that something as powerful as an Inbreaker would just be resistant to that type of type of thing, but I guess not. Yeah, I I I think I probably would have assumed or may have assumed that Leviathan would be too big at this point, but I think it's I don't know, it doesn't like break my suspension of disbelief or whatever because I think Clockblocker is a pretty strong cape. He's this I mean he's described as a quote unquote pretty strong cape. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh so so we don't really know what his uh his upper limits are. Um so then uh while he's frozen, Arms Master gives another rouse quote unquote rousing speech, highlighting the fact that Leviathan has maimed or killed most of the tank capes already, and says two or three minutes more of this and there won't be any of us left. Yeah, apparently all the protector at go to the Inspirational Speech Academy <laughs> by Debbie fucking Downer. Yep, that's accurate. Um, so I don't th- quite think it's a coincidence that I keep going for RPG metaphors here, like tank, because um, w- with the tanks gone, the glass cannons and utility capes really won't last long. So this the battle is not going well at all. Yeah, and I always play a tank in MMOs. So um, as tank, I uh, declare that the failure is entirely up to the healers, the yep. shitty healers. Mm-hmm. Um, does does anyone in Worm play MMOs? Can we be MMO friends? Yeah, I like them. Yeah, yeah. Go uh, check out our EverQuest podcast episode titled "Always Be Questing." Oh, great plug! Yeah, man, yeah. we got nerdy in that one. Yep. There we go. All right. <laughs> so, so uh, Arms Master um, says, "Plan B is so we're doing Plan B now. Plan B is spread out, stall, and hope Scion shows up." That's such a shitty plan. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's that's we're we're at I think we're at the probably the midpoint of the battle, right? And it's basically looks hopeless at this point. Like, and it's funny that it looks hopeless when we've just frozen Leviathan in place, and it's like the first time they've had an a, a, a quote unquote advantage in the battle, but it's still basically hopeless. Yeah. Right. So we move into eight point four, and we we find Arms Master and Kaiser of all people working together to try to build a cage around Leviathan while he remains frozen and to build damaging traps that would hurt him as soon as he emerged from stasis. Taylor moves away from this area, trying to figure out how to apply Arms Master's instruction that she focused on surviving and delaying, and she finds a hiding place and creates some discrete swarms of bugs, which she then causes to condense into human shapes to sort of serve as decoys. Yeah, this feels like a like a natural evolution of the bug suit that she used in the last arc. Um... And I, I don't think it works too well against a fucking Endbringer, but like you see in this moment how useful this could be in future encounters. Yeah, totally. Um, just just highlighting here every shred of info that we learned about the other Endbringers during this part. She's thinking, um, if the Simurg, well, uh, okay, the Simurg was different, I had to admit. The issue with her wasn't so much winning the battle, it was what came after. Win every battle against her, lose the war, more or less. I don't know what this means but (laughs) i'm eating up all this information and trying to construct a theory with it and i think i've got one but we'll cover that at the end yeah i remember i remember i distinctly remember reading that the first time and and feeling like oh give us a break (laughs) (laughs) like like just give these give these people a break it's hard enough (laughs) Um, all right so um waiting for scion to arrive is a pretty unreliable strategy apparently because nobody can contact him and tell him what's going on he might be saving cats from trees on the other side of the world and not know that this attack is happening for hours yeah i have a lot to talk about scion but i think we'll hold off until we actually see him um in the next chapter so let's just hold off on that discussion okay so Taylor, having found a good hiding spot and distributed her swarms, is alerted to Leviathan waking up by her armband informing her of more deaths, including Aegis and Manpower, uh, who we, we know both of those guys. Um, she's, she sees the two giantesses fighting Leviathan, and he kills one of the sisters without much trouble. And Kid Wynn tries to laser him from the sky with his giant S-class laser, but then he gets struck out of the air and, and uh, is down. God, Kid Wynn is the most useless fucking hero ever. I, I don't know why I'm so critical of him. I think maybe it's just when you put Wynn in your name, you better not suck. Because then it just becomes super ironic and hilarious. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely a, a poser um, quality to him, yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. So Leviathan comes into view holding Kaiser's torso, which is one of my favorite moments. Uh, it's just casually as part of a paragraph mentioned 
that one of the primary antagonists at this point is dead. Yeah. It, it's, it's just like the deaths in this section are so casual, right? Um, we see major characters that we've seen before. We've had Taylor's fought with before kind of either die off screen uh, quote unquote screen. It's a book, but uh, die, die casually in front of us or just like get announced as dead from the armbands. Um, which is basically just background noise because it's happening so much. And I think it, this really feeds into those horror elements. Um, but there's also something like real about it, right? Like these, like this guy's so powerful that like, it's not going to be your typical superhero battle where, um, some one person dies at the end, making a noble sacrifice. This is like, um, this is real. Um, people are going to die. And I yeah. realize I just said that a fight between superheroes and a giant walking water monster monster is real. Um, but just deal with it. It feels real. Yeah. It's yeah. It feels real. That's exactly the point. So at this point, Taylor's arm bed, uh, t- Taylor's arm band suddenly goes dead. Uh, Leviathan actually bothers to take out her swarm dummies. Not that it slows them down much. And she retreats, um, from the area, but then returns and sees arms masters having a totally badass duel with Leviathan. Um, Arms Master is obviously a giant prick as a person, but you can't help but be awed in this scene because we've just seen Leviathan effortlessly take apart so many strong capes, and he's withstood this insane onslaught of like five big name capes hitting him one after another. And now Arms Master, who's basically just this guy who is just a guy with the high tech suit and weapons, and he's just dancing around him and just doing tons of damage to him and. It's a it's a pretty cool moment. Oh, it's um, so cool! I I love this. Yeah. Um, he he, do, he does say uh, at one point, or you know, or you, or you know what I was saying, and you know that I already won, just <laughs> just like at the fundraiser, huh, Arms this, Master? This guy you should you should not declare your victories in advance. That's not. Um, and 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 it's it's like a it's plausible that this is happening too. Like he you would you might be tempted to think that it would be like incredible. Like oh come on, Arms Master can't do that. But we do know that his battle computer is pretty formidable. It's we've seen it, you know we've seen it accomplish things in the past. He can react to Leviathan before Leviathan even moves, and he has clever weapons that are prepped, maybe even prepped specifically for this encounter. Uh, and the nanotech halberd weapon seems to do more damage than anything up at this point. So he's definitely like properly equipped to do what he's doing here. Um, he even ha- seems to have copied some aspects of clock lockers power into his tech. Yeah. I mean, he is really powerful. Um, but he, just like you said, overconfidence just continues to be his weakness. And like, it, we learn all about this, this evil plot arms master had, but like, can you think of like how effective this would have been if he had actually tried to work with everyone instead of like, plotting to get this one-on-one fight like they might have actually killed leviathan i mean probably not but like they might have had a much bigger chance if he had worked with people um but he can't yeah it's, it seems like he's been holding this this nano halberd in reserve for this point in time and it's, right. it's like wow why would you hold this super effective weapon in reserve when it, you totally could have used it back when he was killing people a few minutes ago yeah yeah, but this this fight is just dripping with cinematic like beauty. Like I can see it all in my head, and it'd be really cool to see on screen. Yeah. So so Arms Master actually seems to be, to be doing really well. Like you you can't necessarily say he's winning because he never seems to make like a blow that seems, you know, critical. But he's really hurting Leviathan. Uh, but then Leviathan unexpectedly tears up the storm sewers with his hydrokinesis, and uses that distraction to grab Arms Master. Um, and exhibiting none of the weakness or pain that he had moments ago, he rips off Arms Master's arm, uh, and then just like drops him and moves on. So, so I guess he's he's just Arm Master now, huh, Matt? That's correct, Not Scott. Not arms, just arm, because he's nope. one arm. Just one arm now, Scott. That's I'm funny, correct. Scott. There's no, there's nothing funny here. Man <laughs> just lost his arm. <laughs> But his name oh. is Arms Master. It yes. is funny. You do. Yes. I mean, that had to be intentional. Of, of course it was. <laughs> Absolutely. So Skidder tries to help with her bugs, but they're totally ineffective as, as Leviathan escapes. She rushes to help Arms Master, and she finds his arm, but in, like not to be nice. She's just trying to find his armband so she can talk into it. 
and she starts communicating Leviathan's location to the others because she has some bugs now wedged deep into his his wounds, and she can track him. Um, so, yeah. so would you say that Taylor is now Arms Master's arm master? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll stop. Yes, Scott. I'll stop. That's, that's correct. <laughs> Her superhero name is now Arms Master's arm master. <laughs> All right, so we move on to 8.5, uh, Lady Photon and Laser Dream land to collect Arms Master and to serve as Taylor's means of flight. So these are the two capes that have just lost their brother and, and son, respectively. Um, and uh, Taylor is kind of overwhelmed by the pain of just looking at them and how much they're suffering. Yeah, like, I love this because, like, we're finally getting to the point in the battle where Taylor is useful. But before we really get to that, we have this short beat where, like, she's directly confronting the consequences of the fight. Um, people are dying. Families are being split apart. And there's this real sense of heroism in these two women because they go on. They are still going. They just lost their son and their brother, but they're not giving up. And it's just this moment of heroism that's really cool. Yeah, totally. Very different tone here. So Laser Dream lifts Taylor into the air, and she realizes it's her first time experiencing super-powered flight, although she doesn't really enjoy it very much due to the context. And she does notice here that her power is, is stronger again. Hmm. Mm. I, don't, I don't know. Mm. I don't know. Mm. So she gets a beat on Leviathan, and she starts relaying his location to the armband. Leviathan's been tearing his way deeper into the city and doing damage as he goes. Taylor watches another giant wave crash into the city, collapsing buildings along the coast. Um, I like to keep tabs on what's happening with the Weymouth Shopping Center, the location where Taylor socked Emma in the face, I, I think, because um, here it's severely damaged by the waves, and Leviathan is also bodily smashed through it. Yeah, I do. I think you're right. I think this is where this happened, but I, I think it's... It, it works really thematically. Like these are places where Taylor had all these traumatic events occur to her and all these conflicts and they're just being systematically destroyed as if they don't matter. Um, I'm really surprised we didn't like get to see her, see her school get wrecked. I feel like that would have fit very thematically in this. Like look how insignificant this moment of great trauma is for you compared to this big fucking monster. Yeah. Um, I'm surprised. Right, yeah, yeah that, no, that's interesting. Yeah, like as a juxtaposition. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't quite see it that way, but that's, that's very true. So the location where Leviathan finally stops moving is very close to, to where Taylor knows Coil's subterranean base is. Yeah, I'm sure that's just a coincidence and will not matter at all. Yeah, just a coincidence. So the Cape Parian is uh, actually it might be Parian. I'm, I'm really not sure about this one. I always say it Parian. Um, probably wrong is using her telekinetically powered giant stuffed animals to fight Leviathan. And uh, the, the expendability, durability, and power coupled together of the stuffed animals is actually pretty decent in terms of engaging him and, and keeping him occupied. Uh, welcome to my new favorite superpower, because this yeah. is awesome. We're just fighting a giant Godzilla monster with a giant stuffed animal. And I yeah. knitted it together with my magic magic knitting needles because that's my power. Like this is this is amazing. Yeah, this, this is be, really fun. This would be fun. This this is another cinematic moment. I think. Yeah, I was really worried this character was gonna die because I wanted to see more of this power. But as she yeah. gets injured, but not not dies. Whew. Yeah. Whew. Yeah. Um. So Gru is here because we see that Leviathan's vision is blocked by the the shrouding of his power and, and purity and laser dream are pounding him. Um, we do notice that uh, there is a cape, which we eventually found out, find out is named Fletchette, um, who is shooting crossbow bolts at him, which are spearing like through his body, which is uh, remarkable because of, you know, how difficult it's been to damage him up to this point. But, uh, but of mm -hmm. course, they're just they're just like the size of a crossbow bolt, so they can't really, you know, do too much devastation. Yeah, and again, this is an example of Wild Bo's, uh, how he uses information sparingly. Like, we get enough information to know that these are effective bolts, but we don't need to be told why yet. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so shortly after that happens, Leviathan goes directly for Fletchette, uh, but Trickster replaces her with a more durable cape. I think that's a pr pretty cool moment. <laughs> it is, but it's going to be very shocking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, um, okay. Oh, okay. yeah. Thanks, thanks, man. Yeah, I would have to find him and punch him in the face later um 
so Taylor gets some bugs into his eyes, uh, Leviathan's eyes, which manages to finally have a 0.01% tactical <laughs> impact on the battle. Yay! Um, I, I think this is really cool, though, because, like, we're constantly being reminded how powerful he is. Because, um, like, there were moments when in, when Arn's Master was fighting and that we really felt like he had him on the ropes, right? Um, and then he loses that fight. And then he goes and fights this other group of capes and like seems just fine again. And yeah. it's just like, like even like then we have uh, these super powered crossbow bolts that seem to be just penetrating him easily and then seems fine again. And it's just like, are we really doing any lasting damage here at all? Probably not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, then Leviathan does some, some more macro hydrokinesis and, basically turns the area that he's in into a lake by depressing the ground. Um, and laser dream manages to carry away Taylor and the injured Parian while Leviathan darts around in his newly made lake, murdering all the capes that are in there. This dude's such an asshole. I know. He just no consideration. Oh, we have to say that shadow stalker got hurt here too. Cause that's yes. kind of important. Shadow stalker, mildly relevant cape that we may have heard of before. <laughs> So they get it, they get news of a shelter that has sprung a leak. Uh, so I don't think we mentioned that, you know, all the civilians have been herded into these giant shelters, which, I mean, I think the implication is that they're literally like inbringer shelters. Um, yeah, I think so. Which suggests how seriously people take this. Um, so anyway, there's one that sprung a leak. And so Taylor's worried about her dad. She doesn't know where he is, but she thinks, you know, it's plausible that he's in this shelter. Uh, so she convinces Laser Dream to help carry to, to carry her there so she can help and she suggests that the halberd might help dig through the rubble um and she, she once they get to the shelter uh taylor notices that the shelter is surprisingly similar to coral's headquarters which i don't remember noticing that she noticed this because we're going to find out soon why that is yeah um, i was all set up to make a really smart prediction about this and then the interlude tells us oh man <laughs> so clever scott i could have been so smart so insightful. <laughs> half a point. Half a point. Okay. That. Okay. So the capes cut their way inside using the halberd. Uh, Taylor doesn't see her dad, but she does see Mr. Gladly, who she takes the opportunity to mentally castigate. Matt, this is so weird to me. And I've been thinking about it a lot because, like, throughout this battle, we've seen the good side of Taylor. We've seen the fact that she cares about these people and, like, people dying is having an emotional impact on her and then we go to this random moment where like she just like a, a switch flips and she switches back to this like super like vindictive angry like focusing on on this guy in the middle of this chaos it's so weird yeah i mean i i think it wouldn't be inappropriate to say that mr gladly is a bit triggering for her yeah yeah and um, and, and i understand that like i understand how mentally that could happen um it just like it, it's like this it's huge in this moment like she like stops in her tracks to to point all this out um yeah right and like it's it's still a pretty dire situation right um and and in fact even more dire than she realizes and she doesn't really think of it this way but the violin is able to sneak up on them now because she's distracted with this mr gladly thing and he's able to you know sneak up on them and kill all these capes at the door and get inside and kill dozens of civilians I don't know if she could have done anything differently, but, you know, she may have had a few seconds of warning if she'd actually been paying attention to where right. her bugs were. Right. Yeah, she needs to work past this. And I know it's hard. Like, I know she's gone through a lot of trauma, but we really need to see her get past this. Yeah. Um, but this is kind of weird, right, that Leviathan shows up? Yeah. So, like, up until this point, he's been heading kind of in a, a straight line towards a certain point, And we find out later that that's weirdly close to Coyle's base. And this mysterious person that's inside who we'll learn about later. But then he seems to like randomly change direction to come to this leaking fallout shelter. Um, it, it like it seems like there's something really important inside this vault that drew him there. But we don't really ever get to see it. And, and no one really even stops to to think about it. Yeah, I'm not sure if that even occurred to me, but I think that there's there might be something there. So Taylor begins to move to escape or maybe to just find the armband to report the event. I'm not actually sure 
there's not much she can do anyway. She there's nothing she, she can't like step between Leviathan and the people and have anything happen. And th there's no relief nearby, so she decides that she's going to be better than Mr. Gladly, and she grabs the halberd and runs back inside. Yeah, I reread this section multiple times because my first read through, I jumped the. I was angry at Taylor, and I jumped to the conclusion that she ran. And then when she saw the the armband, and then oh, I can f call people and help. And then when that didn't work, she finally made the decision to turn back around. But I I don't. I don't think that's actually what happened. I don't think she was specifically leaving to run away. I think she was specifically going out there to find an armband to call help. I think that that was her plan all along. Um, and but she but she did get a smug sense of satisfaction by abandoning gladly as he's about to die, um, which was a little weird. But I think she always knew she was going to go call for help. And then as soon as she realizes help can't come, she picks up the halberd and tries to do something. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I think there's really no chance that she would abandon the situation. Yeah, but yeah. um, but she kind of wants to on some level. Yeah, yeah. So she stabs Leviathan in where his butthole should be, uh, <laughs> and then and then she retreats, harassing him with more of her swarm clones. But since it's just her at this point, he pretty quickly just nails her with one of his after image claw swipe attacks, hard enough to break her body horrifically and break her spine yeah it's almost as if he just kind of shooed her away right like a right. like a bug yeah um i really i really enjoy wild Bo's description of taylor drowning um because it's very taylor it's like very calculated she's like talking about like and eventually um my lungs will scream for air and that and then that's when i'll suck in the water and then that's when i'll i'll drown it's like so taylor to like yeah. be thinking about the logical steps of drowning um, and yeah. I like how Wild Bo can capture her specific voice and how she would react to these things. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, but just before she drowns, she's saved by Rachel, who has finally arrived. They're best friends. Yep. So all of Rachel's dogs, I, I think, maybe not 100% of them, but a large number of dogs are fully transformed. Six, right? six yeah, six, something in that range, yeah. They're fully transformed and they're attacking Leviathan. Um, they're they're big, but he's thirty feet tall. Um, they're powerful, but Leviathan is stronger, and he kills them one after another, while Rachel looks on in rage and horror. No, <laughs> this is so sad. And the thing that upsets me is the story doesn't even like tell you which are Brutus and Judas. Like yeah. it, it doesn't specify. So like I was like, w were they in the pack? Maybe. Maybe he, she held them back. Maybe they're not here. And it was like, oh, it was devastating. Yeah. Yeah, I Just, know. And I only, it was only a week ago that I said, Matt, I'm starting to get worried about the dogs. And then... Yeah, oh, man. right. Yeah, it's... um, it, It's... This is like the culmination. I mean, this is probably the most tragic moment of the battle because... And, and, it, and it's fitting because it's, it's the last moment of the battle, effectively, right. because... It, like immediately after i think i think leviathan kills all of the dogs just before scion arrives and it's it's literally like it's immediately after like we yeah. have this beautiful moment where like rachel hugs taylor while she's crying watching um yeah. and then it's just like without like any kind of fanfare it's just like oh Zion's here now yep. great fucking timing just drops down golden skin perfectly trimmed golden beard with a blood-stained white bodysuit yeah i like that little detail yeah um i always point out that he has a beard because i mentally imagined scion as looking like a golden dr manhattan for the entire first read through yeah that's that that's kind of how i did too even though you just read beard I, I i didn't see that yeah so i'm i'm actively trying to overwrite my prior uh imagination images um and he attacks Leviathan. His attacks are devastating. They're orders of magnitude stronger than anything we've seen from even the strongest capes. And the impacts burn with golden light after they hit. Leviathan's counterattacks aren't so much endured as just nullified or just ignored. Scion collapses a building onto Leviathan, and uh, then Eidolon arrives and uses an ice power to freeze Leviathan and keep him from escaping. And uh, while... Idolin is there. Taylor gets the impression 
when Sion glances at him, that Sion is disgusted by him. Yeah, so uh, part of me wants to just agree with this. But part of me wonders if Taylor's any biased or not, or if we're getting another unreliable narrator. I'm I'm intended to think no. Um, and this is that that Sion is actually just disgusted by this guy. Um, and I want to talk about Sion for a second with you. Um, because Go for it. so superhero Superman is my favorite superhero. I mean, that's why I named my website the Daily Planet, if you didn't get that reference. Um, but like oh. <laughs> um, I've I've had a lot of talks about Superman with 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 you and with other people. And one of the complaints that I think you've lodged to me before um, is basically that, like, by choosing to be Clark Kent, even for like half his life, Superman is basically valuing his personal life and his humanity over saving people. Um, like, Superman doesn't need to sleep. He could literally just do what Scion's doing here, just, like, constantly fly around the world saving people. Um, I've never had a good, like, counter-argument <laughs> on that, other than shut up, Matt, it's a comic book. Um, but I think this is important here, because, like, Scion looks like a human. We don't know if he is human. Um, but he either is, or he's like Dr. Manhattan... In, in Watchmen where he's attained this level of power and it's kind of stripped away his humanity. And this moment where he's looking down on this hero with disgust, um, he only shows up at places of crisis is like when he feels like it, he can't prioritize crisis events. Um, and he'd let nine and a half million people die in Japan. Um, and like, so part of me thinks like, this is what would happen to Superman if he didn't have Clark Kent. So there's your, there's your counter now. That's, um, Extremely convincing, actually. <laughs> but yeah, but like, again, yeah. we don't. There's so much more we don't know about this character yet. So I'm making assumptions based off of what we know of him right now. But um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just the aspect where, like, yeah. I mean, I mean, how do you how do you become an adequate servant of humanity if you don't have any humanity yourself? Right, the, the, right. And which which Superman maintains essentially by having a life as a human yeah that yeah and sense. we we know the end bringers are not human but scion appears human but he also appears to have no humanity and i think the, the way that the 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 uh the book signifies that is really clever like the detail of his clothes being dirty signifies that in that like he didn't even make this costume right like they made it for him and mm -hmm. he's never probably never taken it off never washed it like he just doesn't care about those things because he's not human yeah i think his face is described as as being like a mask and uh, right right which was like which makes it interesting that taylor gets this impression off of him even though um he doesn't it's like how does she get the impression off of him if his face doesn't really uh yeah i'm not exactly Cause he's sure. like super yeah. disgusted yeah 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 I th I, yeah i think you're right i think that's kind of how it's supposed to come across yeah so after beating down on Leviathan for a few more moments, Leviathan finally flees for the coast, chased by the two powerful capes. Um, Taylor is teleported to a hospital, and immediately she realizes she's being treated poorly due to being a villain. They don't listen to her. They handcuff her to the bed against her cries of pain, and nobody will talk to her. Yeah, and this is when we're seeing Taylor descend towards rock bottom <laughs> and i think yeah. it's just going to keep happening and happening um because it comes at this moment of realization where like scion has showed up and they've won and taylor played a part in in the victory kind of um she helped like she helped people get there she shouted points out um and and like so we feel like okay she's reached her low point and now it's starting to go up and then they slap the cuffs on her and it's like oh yeah uh she's a bad guy forgot about that yeah, right. We're we're not getting a break here. So handcuffed to the hospital bed, Taylor crashes emotionally. She she has a broken arm, a broken spine. She's paralyzed in mid back, as far as she can tell. She still feels responsible for Dinah's captivity, and now there's this fresh heaping dose of trauma and general horror from this battle that just happened. Yeah, I think um, I, this might shock people, but as much as I loved all the battle part of this arc, this point on, I liked it more. Chapter six, seven, and eight. Um, this is this deep dive character work. It's the stuff that I love. Um, I like the action in these books. I love this more. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, and one interesting thing that I'd like to point out is that Leviathan is only in half of the chapters. 
of arc eight. You, you, uh, I always think of it as being the Leviathan arc, but it's really about the characters yeah, as always. Yeah. Yeah. So on, on some level, Taylor knows that she can't be arrested because it would violate the Endbringer truce, which is, you know, we've talked about a little bit, I think the amnesty amongst all the capes during Endbringer fights, but she's shocked at how poorly she's being treated. Yeah, it's um, like we talked about at the beginning how how weird I felt like this truce was where it's like all these like white power Kaiser sitting in the same room as some of the biggest heroes in the world. Um, But after like at the end of it, we've seen what this what Leviathan can do, what these things can do. All of a sudden, this makes sense. Like it just may. Of course, like they're going to a civilization is going to take whatever steps they can to ensure that we've done everything we can to fight these guys back. Yeah. Um, and it, it just it, like it, I loved that it felt weird at the beginning because I think that that feels intentional to me. Like this moment feels really weird and unsettling. Um, and at the end we're like, that's why, because we just yeah. saw yeah, your, your perception of this world shifts a lot over the course of Absolutely. just this arc. Absolutely. So Taylor tries to make herself more comfortable, but she is gradually overcome with the panic of being trapped and uncertain. Eventually a young nurse shows up to check on her. Um, but the nurse refused, refuses to talk to her at first until Taylor appeals to her empathy by telling her details about herself. The nurse first explains that she's not allowed to talk to her because of liability reasons, but eventually kind of opens up to her, but not really. Um, and then eventually leaves, and then Taylor starts playing with her bugs to pass the time. And then Panacea walks in and makes fun of her for doing that. And <laughs> Panacea is just generally a complete shit to her in the scene considering the state that Taylor's in and what she's just been through. Um, she basically makes sure that Taylor is still afraid of what she could do to her before actually helping her. Um, there's an interesting exchange here about morality where I, I think it's somewhat important. Like it's, it's kind of a mission statement or a, or, or a thematic statement rather where Taylor says, I envy you that it's so easy for you to think of things in terms of black and white. I'd like to think I'm a good person, believe it or not. Everything I've done, I did because I thought it was right at the time. In hindsight, some of the ends didn't justify the means, and sometimes there were unforeseen consequences. Yeah, Taylor, <laughs> I mean, she's right, of course. Um, and I think this goes back to our talk about responsibility and choice and consequence. And I mean, she's literally stating those themes here, but this is all important. And it's it's really important that Taylor realizes that some of the ends did not justify the means. Um, and I think she fully hasn't even experience the full scope of this i think she's very specifically referring to the 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 12 year old girl right now when she's thinking of these things but um i think the important thing is not just that taylor says this out loud and realizes it but rather taylor what are you going to do about it now yeah that's the important part yes stuff is gradually falling into place for her i think over the course of this chapter and the next one she does allow panacea to use her powers to heal her um Taylor still has a concussion and it's left unhealed and she's actually much more wounded and has more organ damage than she realized. Um, Panacea heals all this and lets her know that legend, Miss Militia and arms master are coming to talk to her. And this freaks Taylor out. Um, so after Panacea leaves, Taylor concludes that she's going to be arrested. Um, so before that Panacea is just more horrible to her and does hammer home how awful Taylor was at the bank robbery. Um, but I think it's funny because in this moment, I kind of feel an urge to take Taylor's side because only we can be this mean to Taylor. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Panacea is, is being a huge dick. That's for sure. Um, and we've kind of known that she's a jerk since the first time we met her, that very first interlude we saw her in. But we yeah. also don't have a lot of thought into her thought process, right? Um, sh- she's right that we don't fully get what Tattletail did to her in, in the bank robbery part. Like we don't fully understand like how devastating emotionally that was for her. Um, we're obviously more sympathetic with Taylor because we see in Taylor's head and we know that she's trying, although often failing to do the right thing. So, um, yeah, I mean, I I don't think Panacea is particularly good, but she's like, I don't, she's such a, I like her so much and I hope we see more of her because she's such a complicated character. Cause she's like, just like the, I love this idea of the guilt that she can't help everyone is like overpowering for her. Yeah. Right. But for me, what just strikes me about this is it's, it's like walking into the hospital room of someone who's just been in, in a terrorist attack <laughs> and, and making fun of them. Yeah. And, I mean, that's, that's definitely fair. Them. 
Yeah. So Taylor uses her roaches to lift the keys from the PRT officer and to bring them to her, and then she uses them to unlock her cuffs. No, just like some more cool bug stuff that she just learned on the fly. Yeah. She's like, yeah, I bet I can do that. Yep, I can. So she creeps out of her bed, scouting ahead with her bugs, and then she moves over to the next curtain section, and then the next one a couple sections over, and she comes across an unconscious, unmasked hero cape, Shadow Stalker. And when Taylor sees her face, she goes cold. Scott, you do the honors. So I was going to play a clip of We Are the Champions here to celebrate my victory, but that would have gotten us <laughs> content flagged <laughs> like immediately on YouTube. Um, so just imagine me sitting here at my desk with my fists raised yeah. in, in abject triumph. Um, it's Sophia. Sophia. So I was right. You were, um, I did not. You were, sorry, go ahead. You were right. Not even. You not only said was she a cape, you said she was a hero cape and probably a ward. So, <laughs> so yeah, I, I, like this. I, this was kind of a, I guessed it last weekend or last week, but this was kind of a long time coming for me. I don't know if you remember in the first uh, the first arc we did my speculations. I said that uh, Taylor's break with Emma was cape related, which was basically my way of hinting that one of the three bullies was a super was a cape. Um, I didn't know who it was at the time. I was leaning towards Emma for a while. Um, uh, a point against it being Emma was when they went to uh, the uh, the the. Uh, fundraiser and she was there um so she wasn't there in cape form she was just there um and then when sophia like accosted and beat her um in last arc that's when it it sealed to me that okay she's definitely a cape um because that seems like something that like it's very reflective in taylor how taylor was starting to use more physical violence in her to deal with her issues and then, like, from a thematic and narrative standpoint, it just made more sense for her to be on the hero side. Um, and then Ward, because she's younger. I didn't know Shadowstalker was black. Um, I feel like if I had known that, it would have, like, made this more obvious, and I might have just guessed specifically Shadowstalker. Um, but yeah, that, was I mean, my, feel- that was my, my thought process. Yeah, I feel like that's why that was withheld, actually. Yeah, and, and we talked about this online, like we'd think about like translating this to the screen, how they mask this without making it like super obvious um, would be harder. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure how you do that exactly. Maybe you just avoid showing shadow soccer too much prior to this. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, probably. So yeah, that's a, uh, it's a big deal. Scott champagne all, all around everybody. I'm so good. Oh, I'm so good. good. Yeah. <laughs> all right. But we got it. We got to keep moving things. Yeah. 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 So 8.7, uh, Taylor puts the pieces together pretty quickly. She decides that Emma is probably not a cape, uh, but probably knows about Sophia. In fact, she probably found out about it at about the time that Emma turned on her, which makes Scott right. <laughs> Look at that. I'm right again. Yeah. No, um, so we don't actually know if this is true yet, um, but I'm going to take the stance and hopefully you back me up here that until we get information to the contrary, we're going to take taylor's thought process as as fact and say that yes part of the reason why emma uh left taylor and was sophia became a superhero and she's like really into this person and wanted to be her friend and maybe sophia said something to the effect of why do you hang out with that taylor girl um and feeling the peer pressure to prove that she didn't really like her she started treating her terribly and it just snowballed from there so until we hear that that is not true i'm gonna say yes that's right yeah i think that's that's safe. I mean, the worst thing that happens is we learn something contradictory to that and then we have to update it again. But yeah, I, I, yeah. I think that's fine. So arms master finds her in the room standing over Sophia and he, and he grabs her and starts manhandling her. Um, and this is really not a good mental frame for Taylor to be meeting legend. The, this, the Sophia discovery has really, really kind of perturbed her quite a bit. She's, kind of in the process of recontextualizing all of her bullying as being perpetrated by a hero cape uh, while being presently bullied by a hero cape. Yeah, and that's just why when I came to the conclusion that one of her bullies had to be a cape, that they had to be a hero. Because this just this is too narratively and thematically delicious to pass up on. Um, mm-hmm. Like, it just, it just works so well. Yeah. So Legend seems reasonable, although Armsmaster tries to bias him against her, telling him that she's an adept liar who's fooled his equipment in the past. The scene basically devolves into, into the protectorate capes trying to browbeat Taylor into making some kind of concession because they know that she knows Sophia's identity. Uh, I, I will comment here, and I think this, 
this all washes out. But while you're reading it, um, I, I noticed, you know, or it occurred to me that glimpsing somebody's face for a second doesn't really mean you know their identity. Because if Taylor didn't already know Sophia Hess, then the sight of Shadowstalker's face would be almost completely, completely useless to her. Right. Yeah. I mean, like, it would be just random person. And yeah. maybe if you saw them on the street, you'd be like, hey, wait a minute. But yeah, I mean, like, there's nothing specific here. Like, I understand their concern, but I, I think this isn't as serious as they make it out to be. Yeah. And it kind of seems like the protector capes are actually grasping for something that they can use to push Taylor with. Uh, and it's, it, it, I don't know, it, from my view, it's not really about the fact that she saw Shadow Soccer's face, or maybe it is. I don't know. It just, it feels suspicious to me that they're hammering on this so hard yeah um and i th i think that's probably right i think it's you're probably feeling like arms master's anger because she hates because he hates taylor so much um i think legend comes off as more just being legitimately concerned about a secret identity going out plus i think that the truce as important as it is like is super strenuous uh, like it like it doesn't it, it, they treat it as sort of like a necessary evil that the superheroes have to put up with. They don't like like having to deal with stuff like this. They're just kind of annoyed by it, but they understand it's necessary. Yeah, that makes sense. So uh, pretty much the first viable option they offer her to get out of the situation is to join the wards as a on a probationary level. And I think that this is kind of the whole point here. Um, this is the obvious option that they're trying to railroad her into choosing. Yeah, that makes sense, though, right? Because, like, that's the reason, like, she was handcuffed. The reason she was handcuffed at, fir at first was not because she was arrested. Um, it was because there's a whole bunch of superheroes and villains all in the same area, and they don't want the villains wandering around looking at all people's identities, which is, of course, exactly what she does. Um, my guess here is that with the thing that they were going to talk to her about um, was probably asking her to join the wards. It was probably a conversation to the effect of, hey, you did pretty good out there. We're going to give you a second chance. Um, please, like, like consider joining us. Yeah, I, I think that that's valid, especially when you consider that in a second we're going to see that the other undersiders were not handcuffed at all. Right, right. So, so they're not just handcuffing all the villains. They specifically handcuffed her. So, so, so yeah, I think that's very plausible. Mm -hmm. that, that that was the plan and it's completely completely not going to work now because of course taylor now immediately refuses and she says she would rather go to the bird cage the bird cage because knowing sophia is a ward has completely poisoned the well yeah do you think had taylor not discovered that sophia was shadow stalker do you think if they had offered her this would she have done it um i think there's a pretty good chance that I she would too. have i think at this yeah. point at this point in her growth as a character, um, I think she would have seen this as an opportunity. Um, and she's starting to see responsibility and consequences and all this stuff. So, yeah, I think so. Yeah. So it just so happens at this moment, while she's being, you know, strong armed, the, the undersiders are also in the hospital, apparently not arrested and handcuffed. And they come to Taylor when they hear the shouting. Uh, the undersiders are more than willing to treat her as a teammate, at least in this situation. I wonder how much of that is personal loyalty and how much is management of their rep as a team. Yeah, I think for Lisa, it is personal loyalty um, and, and probably a little sprinkling of guilt, as we'll learn about in the next chapter. Um, but yeah, I think for the rest of them, it's it's rep reputation management, Brian especially. Like, we've seen how important that is to him, so. Yeah, I think that's right. So so obviously, Tattletale is shown here to be alive. Yeah, and, and she's fine. alive. Thank God. Yeah. Yes. And Regent is actually probably the worst for wear physically. And Rachel is worse off mentally than anyone else because oh, so she's sad. just lost everything. Yeah. Um, so since Taylor refused the wards, they offer that she provide collateral in the form of revealing her own identity, but Taylor refuses this too. That's because it's stupid collateral because yeah. it's a lot riskier in this world for a villain to out themselves than a cape because a cape has a support system that's legal and like legitimate right. and a villain is on their own. Yeah. So the Undersiders and the Protectorate Capes are playing this dangerous game of brinksmanship here, I think, because you get the sense that the symbolic value of the Endbringer Truce is something that neither side should want to violate because the stakes are so high. But both sides are kind of trying to make the other side capitulate by holding the truce, the truce hostage. 
Yeah, it, it, it very much feels like no one's quite sure what to do. So they're like trying to force the other side into making the first move. Um, and like it seems like the heroes have the support of the law on their side here. But we also see once again that that regulation and law can like weaken them as much as it stands them up. Um, yeah. And it's like because they have they have a reputation. They have to like it would damage the truce to know that they were even thinking about going against it. Yeah. And I think we also get to see in this moment that Tattletail is a thinker seven and Taylor is a master five, um, which is the first time I think we've seen numeric power values attached to them. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, we may not have even heard some of these classifications before. Nope. Yeah. So um, eventually the undersiders agree to leave, but that is actually a ploy uh, so that Tattletail can hack into an armband and use it to broadcast what's going on to all the gathered capes. I like the moment where trickster is is filming the scene with a with a cell phone cam um <laughs> I, I really like him a lot yeah. he's a lot of fun so it turns out that lisa has her own leverage because she's figured out that arms master she's figured out what he was doing which we didn't actually realize as the readers but basically he was using his computer simulations to create a situation where leviathan would be funneled down a path that would kill a number of villain capes and then end up in a one-on-one -on -one with arms master which he thought he could win. So a big portion of the evidence that she has for this, probably a lot of what her power was working off of, is the fact that Skitter's armband was fried. So Tattletail basically makes this case pretty airtight and even offers herself as a captive until it can be verified. And Arms Master lunges at her and Legend knocks him down. This is so huge. I mean, this is like, this is, with the exception of Coil, this is probably like one of the worst things we've seen someone do. Yeah. Um, and it was supposed hero arms master. Um, yeah, he's a, he's a piece of shit. Yeah. And he has his justifications just like some other people. We right. Name. Yeah. I mean, like, and I'm sure in his mind, like, like you said, the road to hell is paved with, with the best intentions. He thought this was the best way to win the fight and they would take out two birds with one stone. Cause like we got Kaiser killed. He was a big thorn in our side. Yeah. He's gone yeah. now. So yeah, right. I mean, but it's, it's terrible. It's awful. Yeah. But, uh, you know, Miss Militia seems pretty ready to believe this story. She's just like, yep, that's that's Colin. Yeah. And that closes the, the circle from the, the look on his face that we saw at the end of last arc. Um, yeah, totally. Which, yeah, masterful setup. Yeah. So. Uh, lashing out against the people who just ruined his life, Arms Master takes this opportunity to finally blow Taylor's secret in front of everyone. All the undersiders are a combination of crushed and furious, except Tattletail, who doesn't seem surprised at all to learn that Taylor was a, a spy, basically. Right again. <laughs> um, yeah. No, the, 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 I mean, like, we talked about Taylor continually hitting new lows, and again, this is, this is, this is it. This is, her, this is her bottom. Um, yep. Just when she thought things couldn't get any worse, bam. Yep. And, uh, and true to form, she, she flees, she just runs. Yep. So we start 8.8. .8. Taylor is now visiting the memorial of the fallen heroes and villains. And it's like quite a while later. And the, the, the memorial is this simple obelisk with the names of the fallen carved into it. Yeah, I love the details on here where she talks about how do they honor those who have died. That they mm -hmm. tried funerals, but they descended into violence and became uncontrollable. So they just kind of gave up. So there's this there's this real sense of sadness here. And it's not just in the people that, that died. It's like... These people came together to fight this giant monster, but like to honor dead, and then people just turn back into the petty, terrible selves. Um, yeah. And and it, like it's really sad because like we saw all these people work together to do these amazing things. Like we saw like they basically made a a, a bo giant body of water disappear and turned to mist. Like ha like if these people worked together, like they could solve all the world's problems, but like it's the petty squabbling that just destroys this all. And like you can see Taylor's frustration with all this. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so as she walks around the memorial, she reads all the names. She goes down the, the entire list of them. Yeah, and we're going to we're going to read them here because we're going to honor the dead too. That's right. Escutcheon. Erudite. Finya. Fiercling. Frenetic. Furrow. Gallant. Geomancer. Good neighbor. Hallow. Herald. 
humble. Impel, Iron Falcon, Jotun, Kaiser, Manpower, Mr. Eminent, Oaf, Pelter, Penitent, Quark, Resolute, Saurian, Sham, Shielder, Smackdown, Snowflake, Strider, Ugly Mug, Velocity, Vitiator, WCM, Zigzag, Coro, Bullet, Milk, Stumpy, Brutus, Judas, Axel, and Ginger. <laughs> Yes. It's a lot of people. Yeah. And and Scott, obviously, as we can see, Gallant is dead. We didn't know that. Velocity is dead. We didn't know that necessarily. Mm -hmm. Maybe we did. Yeah. And Rachel has caught, carved the names of her dogs at the end of the list. I, I think I legitimately almost started crying um, at yeah. this moment because, like, the scene plays out in such a way that, like, you see the names and you're like, wait, what is... And then it like hits you at once what it is like all at once. And it's just like such a gut punch. Yeah. It's like, oh, my God. And then like the like the detail, like the details start to pour out that she must have snuck up here and like spent hours carving into the stone. And it's like, oh, Jesus. Yeah. This is so well set up. Yeah, it really even, is. Can't even express. So Tattletale finds Taylor here and they talk. Um Lisa quickly admits that she knew what was going on all along. Um, she knew from Coil prior to even meeting Taylor, and, and she apologizes for for being dishonest about it. Yep, I was right again. Yep. So Lisa starts explaining Coil's power, and basically he has a constant access to two parallel realities, and he can choose which one to keep. We're going to get into this detail when we get to, to Coil's chapter more, but but basically he's been helping the Undersiders by keeping the reality where the Undersiders are more successful. Yep. So she um she drops some more details on how things would have gone by default without Coil's help. Namely that Taylor would be dead yep. because she would have died in the first interaction. Yep. Um, ultimately, Lisa asks her to come back, and Taylor refuses because she can't let go of the Dinah situation. Yeah, and this here it is. Here's her low point. Um, like we again, we kept thinking we hit it over and over again, and then we, this the, with this one paragraph, she says it. It's like so many dead, so pointless. What was wrong with this world that it was this fucked up? That people like Sophia and Arms Master were heroes. That they couldn't even be a proper funeral for the people who had given their lives because of a small handful of grandstanding idiots. And it's just like she's so defeated. And I really hope that this is the moment where she like is able to find her strength. But I don't know. Like, it really could go either way at this point. Yeah. No, I, I, I think, I think we're, we're being given hope. But, yeah, we're, we're not given the conclusion here. So, basically, Taylor resolves it to herself to be better than all those people who've pulled the strings and let everyone down. And, and she gives her answer to Tattletale. Of course, we don't see what that is right now. Yeah, and the thing I really want to stress here real quickly is how Tattletale manipulates this situation. Um, and it seems like she's very clearly using her powers here, but like th her, her verbiage with prioritizing friends over morals, um, it's like it seems like it's targeted to attack her exactly where it would do the most damage. Like this idea of are you going to give up your friends for your morals? Like it's just like, Lisa, come on. Like I know yeah. she cares about her and I know she wants her back, but it's like that's kind of fucked up. Yeah. You shouldn't make a person have to choose between those things. Yeah. Still, still so distrustful of Lisa Scott. <laughs> All right, so um, we'll move we'll move into uh, the coil interlude, and uh, I mean I think this is a pretty awesome interlude, um, and there's there's plenty to talk about here. Yeah, but we're gonna move at a fair clip just because you know. So in, in one reality. Coil stays up all night in his highly secure base reading and keeping tabs on things. In the other, he gets a good night's sleep in his suburban home and heads into work. A soldier called Creep, over whom Coil has a strong hold because of his, quote, predilections, picks up Coil in a van where he changes into his disguise. As we'll see, Coil is really big on hooks, vices, or burning needs that certain individuals may have that can be used to exploit them. He specifically names the Travelers and Gru as being other cases of this principle. 
In the fail-safe reality where he stayed up all night, Coyle asks Dinah a series of safety check questions trying to establish how safe the base will be for the immediate future. Once she tells him it'll be pretty safe, he dismisses that reality and keeps the one where he got a good night's sleep. Of course, he keeps all the memories from the reality that he dismissed. Yeah, so I want to spend the most of the time in this interlude talking about this power. Um, so let's, let's, first of all, it's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it, like, it, the, like, I think he's not even fully sure what it is, right? It's, it's either yeah. a, a, literally a new reality is created or he's just seeing like a vision of something and he's not right. even really sure. Um, but it, it's just like this like recontextualizes everything we've seen so far because we basically learn that everything that's happened to the undersiders since Taylor joined the undersiders and even before that point was done with Coyle's help and like every time they got out in a scrape like like just barely escaped um except for I think they say the bucket of fight he wasn't there um because as cool as this power is wild bull also gives it very clear limitations and i think that's right. very clever as well there's only two realities he can only do this so if he's working on something else he can't help another team stuff like that um but um and it, like how much how much of what's happened has happened because he got rid of the reality where something else happened like the the conversation between that we just saw between lisa and taylor um is this the conversation where coyle told her to do this or Coyle told her to do that. Like there's so many moments in this now that we have to think like, what was the alternative? And is, are we not seeing that merely because Coyle used his power? And it's just like, so like mind blowing. Yeah. Right. And, uh, he's also like what we just saw him do where he asked Diana the questions and then dismissed that reality. He's basically getting free uses of her power by leveraging his power. Yeah. And that's, and that's, where I love the thematic resonance of this power and how it ties in so well and, and how like for this point in the chapter, he serves as the perfect like antithesis to one of the main themes, which is choice and consequence because right. Coyle's power is literally removing the consequence from choice. I mean, that's, yeah. that's what it is and how this fits in so well with what we've seen with Taylor. Like, it's just so smart. Like I, like, I love it so much. It's so cool. Yeah. No, that's that's true. I I was I realized that just as you were just as you were saying it, I was like, yeah, wow, it's it's a perfect uh, a perfect foil for for Taylor's struggle, actually. Yeah, yeah, and I also like that. Like we do this cool thing where like we learn what this power is, and then basically Wild Bo just for the rest of this chapter just says, oh look, here's all these amazingly cool things you could do with the power, <laughs> and like right. that's we just see like all the different ways Coil can use it. Um, clever ways terrible monstrous horrible ways like we see it all like in the course of just this one single chapter and i'm sure there's a bunch of other cool things he could do with it but we see like a, a gamut of different things oh yeah no it's it's non-stop yeah it's like so immediately here he forks realities again and then in one of them he, he begins aggressively organizing a series of attacks on the remnants of the abb uh, sorry the empire 88 and in the other he kind of hangs out and surveys the base and walks around and yes we learned that his company did indeed build the shelters in addition to the base. Um, so in the more sedate timeline, he heads with his assistant, Mr. Pitter, to talk to Trickster. Uh, Mr. Pitter is another man who has been bought through special dis dispensations. Uh, there's been some kind of issue surrounding somebody in a containment facility. And it's I love how this is gradually, like we're gradually given these breadcrumbs about what's going on here. Um, and there's this very subtle but excellent horror tone that's creeping in uh, it, it kind of, un, you know, under and inside everything in this chapter. Yeah, um, it, it is. It is another great example of, of how Wild Bo manages tone. But it also, on top of that, is like how he handles different points of view, right? Um, because we see that horror-esque tone to it. But like the prose is also structured differently here. Um, like, so we see how Wild Bo can get into the mind of these head into the heads of these people and write them differently. So Taylor talks differently in narration than Coyle talks in narration. And totally. we've seen this in other characters, but because of how different these characters are, like it's really prevalent here. Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. Yeah. Coyle really stands out as having his yeah. own voice when he's, when he's speaking from other people's points of view and even within his, within his own head, he has his own voice. Right. 
So we learn that somebody called uh, Noel has been causing trouble and Trickster has had to talk her down. So Trickster, Coyle, and Mr. Pitter go to see Noel. They head down to a giant vault door and talk to Noel on a screen. And I just love the horror. A girl's face took up most of the screen. Her face was framed with brown hair, greasy, and she had dark circles under her eyes. Her eyes moved as she looked at the monitor on her end, but she didn't reply. Hey, Trickster spoke. Hey. Her voice had a ragged quality to it, as though she had screamed herself raw. Oh, yeah, this is so good. I lo- you're yeah. right. I mean, this is straight out of, like, a horror movie. Yeah. They're trying to soothe her with some kind of fix that is in the works, and she loses her temper pretty quickly and screams. She's she's screaming, fix me, you did this to me, Grouse! And then, like, there's this bone-rattling impact against the vault door, and, like, everyone nearby, like, like is startled and, and terrified. Um, so Coyle is unhappy with how this is going, so he just ends this reality (laughs) and and starts over talking with his captains and i love the uh ensure that the girl has double rations this morning (laughs) and 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 then the mr pitter responds the the costs and it's like just that by itself you're like oh my god so her ration whatever whatever's going on the rations are such that the costs might be prohibitive right like yeah that's that's two lines of dialogue packs so much like what the hell yeah like who is this? like yeah it's it, it's this this really great moment of who is this person like right. just like seeing how people react to like the door like like the monster hitting the door type of thing and seeing how physically and immediately everyone reacts to it god it's so good yeah yeah um did i did i skip over mentioning that um that coil is also thinking about the fact that leviathan has basically been heading you know his path was basically a path i think he says that a little later but yeah okay. he does right. he does mention that um yeah and he says specifically towards noel right yeah um, yeah basically like like the only thing that's here that, that he could be interested in potentially would be noel yeah at least in his view um so he he divides realities again and he asks diana the morning questions again plus a few others we, we learned that his grand plan we don't know what that is, but it has a 72% chance of success, and he knows he can raise that by continuing to use his power. The Undersiders will keep serving him, most likely, but will probably see some changes in their lineup. And the odds of providing Noelle with her fix have actually gone down significantly since the Leviathan attack. Yeah, this is a whole bunch of setup that I can't really comment on because I don't know how to interpret a lot of it yet. Um, I mean, 72% is obviously huge, um, but... I. Th- the the changes to the lineup thing and the undersiders thing feels to me like we're supposed to think that's Taylor turning down Lisa's offer, um, which kind of makes me think it's the opposite of that because it seems like a deflection, um, like we're intentionally trying to indicate that so it might be different or maybe we're we're doing a Princess Bride and it's we're thinking of that so it's actually this way, <laughs> and, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so yeah. it's interesting stuff though. How, how many levels deep of misdirection? <laughs> So, uh, Coil, yeah, so, um, yeah, so, so Dinah is verbalizing her suffering regarding her drug addiction while Coil is ruminating. And he just ignores it. Yeah. Like, it's so yeah. tragic. It's awful. Yeah, he's, he's, he's definitely the most, like, callous person we've been in the head of, because he's just like, you're distracting me from my train of thought, and, and, uh, and, uh, banishes that and, timeline and it again. And it feels like that's kind of a result of his power, right? Like, if if things aren't going his way, he just gets rid of it. So why be concerned with people? Because it's yeah. just like, Oh, I, I don't like this. Go away. Yeah. And then it l- right. literally goes away. So yeah. Yeah. He, he never, he never has to be invested in any interaction with right. anyone. And I, I'm sure he begins to see everyone as, as disposable, uh, which is you're, you're exactly right. It's directly shown because the next thing he does is he invites Mr. Pitter into his office and then branches the timelines, and in one reality, he gives Mr. Pitter an order to give Dinah her drugs, and in the other, he traps Mr. Pitter in his office, presumably to be used for torture murder purposes. I, we, we don't we don't know, and that's yeah. what's so great about it. And and thus ends the epilogue of Book One of Worm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly the right tone to be striking. Here. <laughs> no, it is really good though. I mean, like, it, in general, like. I, th- I try to think like if this is the end of book one, I try to think of like if this book had come out and I was reading the end of it, like it, there, there's definitely a sense of build and climax to this arc in general. Um, and like, 
it, there's still so many unanswered questions. We still don't have a really clear picture of what the end conflict of this entire story is going to be yet. But I think like if this was a book and I, I would be satisfied by this as a book, as long as I knew that the, the next book was definitely coming. Right. And you don't have to worry about that, luckily. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Scott. So let's move on to your speculations that you will you will tell us and then I will listen and make no comments whatsoever. OK, so I kind of went a little crazy here because I usually try to be as like vague and broad as possible <laughs> to make sure to set myself up for wins. Um, and that happened this week because I got three things right, which is huge. Um, but I'm going to go a little crazy uh, with my new one this week. Um, so. I, once we saw what these endbringers were, I started thinking a lot about this and, and what this means and how it recontextualized the world. And the theory that I've come up with, the working theory that I'm sure I will update as we go, um, is that the giant ball, dying thing we saw uh, in Miss Militia's vision in the last interlude was an endbringer as well, and it was dying, and its like dying move was to seed people and give powers to all these humans on Earth. Um, for I don't know why, but um, and the reason I think that is because we know that there are three, and like we know that there are three, and one of them is kind of water themed, and I think there's a hint like they say something about a behemoth with magma. Or something so that made me think that's either like fire or earth themed and my rpg obsessed fantasy obsessed mind immediately says oh they're the four elements and we're missing one so that could be that one so that's that's my guess there and i think that makes sense because then my my theory would be that scion was responsible for killing that last endbringer um and maybe that's why he looks upon these capes with such disgust because they're like an impure like result of uh, the killing of the Sunbreaker, and that would also kind of explain why they never seem to kill them because it, like it seems like Scion is just so much more powerful than this thing that he, like he just completely overpowers it and it's powerless against him and they chase after it but I I think they say in this section that it's not dead right I'm, I'm, I'm I mean I'm convinced it's not dead but I don't know if they say it or not it's you not know? Okay. Yeah. So that would kind of make sense why he doesn't just kill these things. Cause maybe like he's afraid or it's just when you kill something like this, that's what happens. It does this last minute. I'm going to seed people and create a lot of chaos in this world by giving all these people powers. I don't know that that's my theory. Um, I, I'm, I, it could be totally off base. I went really out there with this and got really specific. So I'm sure if, if parts of it are right, it's definitely not hundred percent, but, um, that's, that's my, my fantasy nerd fueled theory. Well, I mean, that, that's, that's great. I think people are going to enjoy that because everyone goes through the process of forming theories as, as they're going. And, and it's, it's fun to see where someone's head is at based on what they've seen. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, it, and if you're right, then extra bonus points, but I don't even think, I think it's plenty fun, even if you're not. Yeah. Yeah. And my, my, I'm going to answer, what Taylor's decision is going to be here too. Cause I think it's only fair that I have to do that. <laughs> um, but I think Taylor is going to make the decision to rejoin the undersiders. I think there's going to be a lot of caveats to that. Um, I think she's either going to convince the group that they need to, uh, kind of do what she was doing originally and try to infiltrate coils group and save the girl. And, um, I think she's, she's officially decided that being a hero in this system isn't the way to go because it's too corrupt and there are too many bad people involved. Um, but that she can make a difference and be heroic in her own way. And she is going to try to convince the rest of the group that, that, that they need to, they need to exist as a group that, um, tries to help improve the world through their own methods, um, outside the system. So I think they probably like stop with like petty robbery and stuff like that and try to do more focused missions to either damage, uh, what's going on with the protectorate or the, or the legal system within this world. All right, Scott, uh, as always, we, <laughs> we, love, we love your speculations. Um, all right. I look forward to seeing how this all plays out. I don't know how I, how I compress these two down <laughs> into like a, a one line item for the Excel sheet. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can see, yeah, I'm going to try to do that. Um, but you can see these and all my other speculations on my Scott's speculations, uh, 
uh, Google Doc, which I've created and linked in the show notes. So you'll be able to see that and, and check that and, up and see it as I update it. Um, so if you want to see how I'm doing percentage wise, I've gotten four right and two wrong. Um, so I'm doing pretty good. Yeah, I think you might want to break some of these into sub predictions, honestly, because there's there's a lot going on in both of these, actually. And, and yeah, yeah, you know, you're, right, you, you're you, right. You stand to be right or wrong about a number of kind of sub uh, sub points. So yeah, it, it just it just at the end of this book, it just feels like the spot to be bold, you know? Yeah, totally. Yeah, because they've given you quite a load of new information right, in, in right. this last arc. Plus, I just got three right in one episode, so I'm like riding high. I yeah. can't, I can't be wrong. No, your your instincts are, <laughs> are razor sharp, Scott. All right, so that wraps up arc eight extermination. I hope everyone enjoyed our discussion and hearing Scott's reactions. As always, we appreciate your feedback. And we're always trying to improve. So let us know if you have any advice, any questions or thoughts on this week's episode. You can reach us via our new email address at gotwormpod at gmail.com or on Twitter at gotwormpod. Uh, my personal Twitter is at scottdaily85, that's D-A-L-Y. And Matt's is at more dinamail. Did I say that right? Yes, you did. Yes. Um, I, don't, I don't know how to spell it, but... It's in the show notes. Um, you should follow us, though. Uh, we talk about funny things a lot. And um, I, I think you should follow the the Got Warm Pod Twitter. I think I'm going to start, like, putting my immediate reactions and tweets on there. So if you want to see, like, as I'm reading for the first time what, like, some of my immediate reactions are, um, you, can, you can subscribe to that Twitter. I think that'll be fun. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. If you're not already subscribed to We've Got Worm... We strongly recommend you do so and never miss an episode. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, and pretty much anywhere else in the world you can listen to podcasts. Friendly reminder that uh, as of this recording, it is still listed as the Daily Planet podcast, but you'll soon be able to subscribe to We've Got Worm individually. Yeah, and we will make sure to make that announcement very clear on these next few episodes, so you have t ample time to do that. Um, and uh, also you can find all the other podcasts we do, all of our writing, essays, uh, film and TV criticism and everything else at dailyplanetfilms.com. That's right, Scott. We also have a Patreon page, patreon.com slash dailyplanetfilms. We've hit our first goal, uh, but we've still got a lot of other fun things planned in there, including a fan art competition for actual prizes uh, and a return of the Daily Planet book, book Club book club, where we tackle other non-Wild Bow novels of your choice and more. Check it out and please donate whatever you can spare. A special thanks to our new patrons as of this week, Josh, Marvin, Igor, Tim, and Eli. Thanks so much, guys. Yeah, that's that's a great list. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, and if you are one of those that, that cannot spare any extra cash, we completely understand. But there are still tons of ways to help us out. Um, if you're listening via iTunes, if you could take a minute to rate and review the podcast, that would be helpful. We did see we got some additional ratings and reviews in after our announcement on this last week. So thank you for those that did that. This is going to be especially important as soon as the, the We've Got Worm individual feed launches, because like especially for new podcasts like like uh, iTunes rates ones that get quick number of, of reviews and, and ratings like as really important. So we're going to put this podcast in a whole nother category. It won't be in the TV and film category that we existed and it'll be in the literature category. So if we, if we come into this thing and hit it running with a lot of reviews and ratings, we'll go up on the list and um, it'll bring exposure to us, which is good and to, uh, to worm. So that's also very good. Yeah, and of course, while, while you're tooling around on the interwebs, be sure to uh, visit Wildbo's Patreon and uh, donate to him, too, because he does this for a living. Uh, as a final reminder, uh, next week's ep episode will be our first official mailbag episode. Uh, get your questions in via the Reddit thread or email them to us at gotwormpod at gmail.com. Yeah, and I think, Matt, we had one more thing we wanted to do, uh, because we know that there's like a thriving worm and wildbo community on the Parahuman subreddit. But we don't know if there's other places that there are worm communities out there. Um, if you think that you know some that would really appreciate this podcast, appreciate what we're doing here, um, either let them know or let us know and we'll reach out to them because we love attention and we love listeners and we want as many people to, to listen to us and we want as many people as possible to be exposed to this, this great novel. Yes, well, it's, it's a public service we're doing here, Scott. Yeah. Spreading, the, spreading the good word oh, we're so kind so kind yeah. well that wraps things up for this week we will see you all next time mailbag
Okay, we went over. We went over. <laughs> We're at like 214. Fuck! Scott Daly, down. CD, five. Matt Freeman, down. CD, five.